So a long, long time ago now, I saw a video entitled Where Varian Worked, Where Cassandra Failed, Tangle the Series Analysis. And I wasn't quite sure what to think. I agreed with some points and disagreed with other points. So I shared it with Alibi to see what she thought. At the time, I was pretty blasé about the whole thing. It was obvious the creator, Callie Star, was underselling Cassandra's character and overselling Varian's. But I didn't see much wrong with the video aside from that. But since analysis is kind of our thing on this channel, we wanted to respond to some of the flaws we noticed. Then life happened as it always does, but we finally sat down to rewatch the video and take some notes for our response script. And that's when the glaring issues of this video hit us in the face full force. Callie Star titles it as an analysis. An analysis is a detailed examination of the elements or structure of something. A fair and honest analysis should be objective. You need to put aside your personal feelings, honestly present the facts of whatever it is you're critiquing, give grounded explanations and evidence for your reasoning, and measure what you find according to objective standards. But Callie Star didn't do that. Her analysis is only surface level. She presents her points as given fact, but offers little to no evidence or explanation to support her claims. And her conclusions are clearly steeped in personal bias. To add to the confusion, she often flips between speaking from an external perspective to speaking from the character's internal viewpoint, without any clarity as to when she switches. Which, unfortunately, leads to some awkward moments where it almost sounds like she is victim blaming or else completely misrepresenting what actually happened. And that's not even the worst of it. As I said, analysis is kind of our thing. So our main goal with this video is just to point out the issues in her analysis and also to set the record straight about Varian and Cassandra's character arcs. If you haven't seen Tangled the series yet, be warned, there will be spoilers. And also, you should totally watch it. Anyway, let's take a look, shall we? Right off the bat, Callie Star starts off on the wrong foot. She says, Let's start by figuring out how we're supposed to do this kind of arc and look at the great writing behind Varian. Initially, we thought those were two different goals. Figure out how to do this kind of arc, and then take a look at Varian's writing. But it becomes increasingly apparent while watching her video that to Callie Star, those things are one and the same. After detailing Varian's arc, she presents a formula saying that sympathetic setup plus traumatic event times good intentions with bad actions equals engaging corruption arc. And it isn't a bad formula. Callie Star never gives any examples outside of Varian, but Anakin Skywalker from the Star Wars prequels would also be a good fit. The problem is she doesn't actually compare Varian and Cassandra to that formula. She seemingly derives it from Varian's arc. I've certainly never heard of it outside her video, and Google offered no results. And then she claims that Cassandra's arc doesn't fit and thus is badly done. And with Varian, yes, the different factors of the equation are present, but they are rushed, which isn't great execution, but Callie Star still holds them up as a gold standard. And it can reasonably be argued that Cassandra's arc does fit the equation. But even if it didn't, that formula is not the only way that writers can create a good corruption arc. When it comes to the execution of something like a character arc, there is no single method of supposed to do in writing. There are objective standards to reach and principles to follow to help you reach those standards. But the execution of those principles can look vastly different. Light Yagami from Death Note never experienced a traumatic event. He simply let power go to his head. Jinx from Arcane experienced multiple traumatic events, and her killing spree made it clear that she harbored no good intentions. Harvey Dent, otherwise known as Two-Face from The Dark Knight, also definitely didn't have good intentions behind his actions. And the list goes on. There are many well-written corruption arcs that do not follow Callie Star's formula. By choosing to start with Varian to see how we're supposed 
to do a corruption arc, Callie Star is starting from a limited and biased perspective. And that's one of the biggest problems with her video. She talks like she's being objective, but her obvious bias toward Varian's character skews her analysis of his arc. And her bias against Cassandra's arc causes her to be merciless toward the character, which we'll get into as we go on. We don't want to just do a call-out video. We want to do a proper comparison of the two characters. We figured the best way to kill those two birds with one stone is to go through Callie Star's video point by point, exposing her biases and other issues, and responding with more objective analysis and discussion of the characters through both their corruption and redemption arcs. She discusses Varian and Cassandra separately, first him and then her, but we'll be discussing them side by side. So her points will be out of order, but we'll be including them with as much context as possible. Let's begin with their character establishment, the sympathetic setup part of Callie Star's equation. As she says, their personalities are polar opposites. She describes them thus. Cass is cynical and matter of fact, while Varian is optimistic and bugly. And I was halfway through writing this script before I came back to this point and realized I don't entirely agree with this description. We'll speak about Cassandra later, but as to Varian, he puts on a show of optimistic confidence, but it seems more like false positivity or naivety rather than real optimism. When things go wrong, his whole countenance crumbles. He doesn't naturally look on the bright side or seek the silver lining. So either he was putting on a show of positivity to cover up his insecurities, or else he really just thought that things wouldn't go wrong. Personally, I feel like it's a bit of both. He is naive, and he's trying to cover up his insecurity. But in any case, I feel it is accurate to say that Varian perseveres. Despite the setbacks, he keeps on trying and that comes into play later. When Callie Star goes into detail with Varian, she says, In a way, Varian feels like a tragic hero character. All he wants to do is create a successful invention that will change the world for the better and make his father proud. But he seems to be destined for failure as something always goes wrong with his creations at the last second. Let's talk about those claims. She's right that he just wants to create something that will benefit people and make his father proud. That's obvious from the start. He's confident that his skills and knowledge can help people, and when his father doesn't support him the way he wants, Varian is understandably hurt and upset. His song, Let Me Make You Proud, clearly expresses how this makes him feel distrusted and like he's not truly known. If you for once could just trust me, maybe then you will realize that you never actually knew me at all. But is he really destined for failure with something always going wrong? In his first appearance, the first episode, his failure is due to him ignoring glaring risks and not handling a volatile chemical with more caution. The dialogue implies that this is not the first time that he's messed up and endangered people. Very little is known about Varian and what is, isn't good. Some say he's dangerous. And I can't let this happen again! Ah! Not again, Varian. But given that he's not being more careful with his experiments, it seems he hasn't really learned from previous mistakes. In his next appearance, episode 8, he doesn't really fail. Yes, he doesn't win first prize because the judge is a hack, but his invention works flawlessly and he successfully impresses Cassandra, which was his main goal in that episode. You should have won. It doesn't matter. The truth is, all I really wanted to do was impress you. But you did impress me. So Callie Star claims that he always fails, and phrases it like his failures are out of his control, and yet neither of those claims are true. She goes on to say, Varian has been stuck in this trap of being so close to success but tripping at the finish line for a while now, and the cycle of disappointment has taken its toll on him, as it would any person. Yet, he doesn't really show it. This is pure conjecture. All we know from the dialogue is that he's messed up before. We don't know how many times, we don't know that it's been a consistent cycle. She's jumping to unfounded conclusions and presenting it as fact. 
And then she completely dismisses the lack of evidence for this in Varian's behavior by claiming that he's just covering up how he really feels. She continues, After a string of disasters, the audience already has at least some pity for Varian. After all, he is only a teenager, and he has nothing but good intentions. Now we have a likable character with a problem that he needs to fix, and we're all rooting for him to overcome this struggle. Again, she has no real basis for making these claims about Varian's establishment, and thus her remarks about how it made the audience feel are also unfounded. If you felt the way she says, that's perfectly valid. But Callie Star's claim for why you felt that way is not accurate. She throws a half-hearted clarification into the middle of her conclusion there, admitting that this string of disasters isn't really much of a string. After a string of disasters, actually we only see Varian screw up twice before Queen for a day. But it does nothing to affect a difference in her conclusion, which in a fair and honest analysis, it should. Anyway, other than Kieran and the Rapunzel gang, Varian doesn't seem to have any social network. Which makes sense. The other people of Old Corona have a very good reason to keep Varian at arm's length. They've been victims of his failures. In episode one, we see Holmes destroyed, people frightened because of what he did. Kieran, thank goodness you're here. Kieran, what do we do? It was terrible. And as I said, we know it's not the first time. But of course, that fact wouldn't make the seclusion any easier for Varian. So in a nutshell, we have a persevering side character with big dreams of making a beneficial mark on the world. But his significant abilities are largely unrecognized, leaving him feeling distrusted and disconnected. He believes that if he could just prove to people, especially his father, how smart he is, he would get the recognition he deserves. We get to see him twice, eight episodes apart, and that's all the setup we get before his traumatic event, which is another eight episodes later. As Callie Star admits, You pretty much forget he exists by the time episode 16 rolls around. She says later, The only criticism I have is that I wish we got to spend some more time with Varian. I think it would have made Varian's betrayal much more emotionally impactful if we had spent some more time with him before it happened. Like at least a few subplots or something. And other than it being the only criticism, we agree. More time spent establishing the character would strengthen the setup. Like we said earlier, we have the presence of that sympathetic setup, but the execution is lacking. However, Callie Star concludes, What we get is still great, I just think it could be even better by amping up the stakes so that it's not some random side character who is suddenly getting a ton of attention. So she recognizes that the execution is weak, but she glosses it over as a minor thing. This is part of what makes her analysis only surface level. You can't learn how to execute good writing principles if you aren't actually studying the execution execution of said principles. As a side note, H Bomber Guy has a great review of Ruby, wherein he discusses the problems with writers only looking at surface level details instead of properly analyzing what makes those details work so well. If you are familiar with Ruby, I recommend watching the whole video. If not, there's a timestamped link in the description to where he starts talking about what I'm referring to here. But let's move on to Cassandra's establishment. The creator Chris Sonnenberg said the goal was to make her Rapunzel's opposite in every way. So we just wanted to make her as opposite in character, like she wasn't as positive as Rapunzel, she wasn't as outgoing as Rapunzel, she's much more, much more of a loner. Um, so she's opposite in, in as many ways as we could find. Because the entire series is based around them, they are the yin and yang, dark and light optimism and pessimism. And as Callie Star points out, conflict between the two in the first season mainly boiled down to just opposing personality traits. It's important to note that this isn't entirely wrong, but it is a surface level generalization. As Callie Star even admits a few minutes later, there is an underlying conflict that the writers of the show are trying to set up for future episodes. But from her generalization of the girls' conflicts, she claims that it's a good thing they stayed contained in single episodes because the drama they had never carried enough weight to last more than one episode. Otherwise, it would risk becoming repetitive and tedious to watch. She's setting up her later complaints for Cassandra's villain arc by sidelining the deeper establishment that 
that's going on here in the beginning of the show. Ultimately, Cassandra struggles with the feeling of being overlooked. She wants her abilities to be recognized and relied on. She wants people to respect her as a capable and independent person. All this time I tried so hard to prove that I was more than everyone thought, but they were right. As mentioned earlier, Callie Star describes Cass as cynical, and while that's not necessarily wrong, we feel it's more accurate to call her emotionally guarded, a trait that she attributes to being raised by the Captain of the Guard. She projects a persona of cold strength, stifling her soft side in the presence of most people. She feels that if she could just prove to people, especially her father, how strong she is that she would get the recognition she deserves. Sound familiar? At its heart, it's exactly what Varian wants. I, I, I wanted to make you proud. No matter how much I want it or how hard I work, his standards for me are higher than they are for anyone else. Yeah, my dad's kind of hard to impress too. Cassandra's setup is given more time to develop though. We see many events, big and small, stacking up through season one and the first bit of season two. In season one, she just wants her dad to trust her with the position of royal guard. So in Challenge of the Brave, she tries to prove her combat prowess in the tournament, but Rapunzel takes the win. Just when I thought I might get even the slightest bit of respect. In Great Expectations, she gets a chance to chase her ambitions, but at the end she regrets how she'd sidelined her friends, and so she chooses to set aside her guard pursuit in the moment to make things right. Well, as captain of the guard, turning down an assignment doesn't bode well, but as your dad, I'm proud of you. Then in Under Wraps, she manages to make up for that to her dad by dealing with the Separatist threat, despite Rapunzel's interference. After the exposition debacle, this was my big chance to prove to my dad I have what it takes to be a guard. But you messed that all up, Rapunzel. I'm just glad to be back on my dad's good side. Note how even though her dad told her he was proud of her in Great Expectations, she still considered herself to be on his bad side until she proved herself a capable guard again. It goes to show that her mentality isn't easily swayed. In Painter's Block, the captain gives her a missing persons assignment, which she successfully solves with Eugene's help. But in Not in the Mood, she makes a fool of herself due to the mood affecting potion, and she loses out on another chance to prove herself as a capable guard. Then in Secret of the Sundrop, the king finds out Cass took Rapunzel out of the castle and sends Cass away to a convent. Her dad doesn't stand up for her. The last thing I ever expected was for you to be the one to disappoint me. But Rapunzel needs her to break free of the tower. And then when everything hits the fan, her father needs her to lead the assault on old Corona. They can trust me. Overall, season one is full of ups and downs, but in the end, her father gives her the trust that she was longing for. So then season two introduces a shift. Cass is now Rapunzel's bodyguard and everything is great, right? No, it wasn't about becoming a guard. It was about receiving trust and respect. And what happens right off the bat in season two? Adira shows up. Ugh, Adira. Adira has everything Cassandra wants. She's a strong warrior, people look up to her, listen to her advice, trust her, respect her, admire her. And she is confident in herself and her direction in life. And meanwhile, Cass keeps being reminded that she's not all that. In Beyond the Corona Walls, Cass tries to assert her authority as a bodyguard, quickly deeming Adira a danger since they don't know anything about her. But Rapunzel isn't quick to agree with Cass. Not gonna happen. Just a second, Cass. Let's hear her out. In Goodbye and Goodwill, Rapunzel doesn't trust Cass to successfully lead the planning of the festival. In Forest of No Return, the narrative mainly focuses on Eugene, but we see again how everyone turns to Adira for guidance and help as soon as she shows up. In Freebird, Rapunzel dismisses Cassandra's advice again, and it almost ruins everything. 
Cass's narrative presence is quiet for about seven episodes after that, which I don't think was a great writing choice in regard to her arc, but those episodes are busy exploring slash expanding Rapunzel's character, so it's not necessarily bad writing in general since Rapunzel is the main character. But then we get to the Great Tree. Right off the bat you have Rapunzel choosing not to heed Cass's advice, making a risky jump. Raps, wait! It's too wide! You could- But when Cass confronts her about it later on, Rapunzel responds, I don't need someone to keep me safe. Look at Cassandra's reaction. This is a key moment here. Rapunzel has grown beyond Cass, but Cass hasn't grown beyond Rapunzel yet. She isn't ready or willing to give up that wonderful feeling of having someone rely on you, need you. And so there's this delightful unrealized conflict between the two girls, born out of the progression of Rapunzel's character arc. As she tells Cass later, I'm not that naive girl fresh out of the tower anymore. I am going to be queen someday. She's going to have to make important, tough decisions, and she won't always do what her advisors suggest. She'll do what she believes is right. That is a lesson she learned in Queen for a Day. So Rapunzel is not inherently wrong for not listening to Cass. There are several situations in which we think Rapunzel did the wrong thing by dismissing what Cass had to say. There are also several times where we think she made the right decision by not taking Cass's advice. And there are some times where we think that neither of them were entirely right or wrong. But the important thing is that Rapunzel doesn't need Cass in the same way anymore. She she still wants Cass as her friend. She just doesn't need her anymore as a protector and guide. But Cass still wants Rapunzel to need her, even while she wants to be separate from Rapunzel, so that she can finally stand apart. It's this really interesting dichotomy of desires. She doesn't want to let go of Rapunzel, but she also doesn't want to be stuck with Rapunzel forever. And that creates both an internal and external conflict that, as said, was created by the progressive progression of Rapunzel's character arc, and can only be resolved through a progression of Cassandra's arc. In a positive character arc, Cass would grow to a point where she would either feel secure enough to let go of Rapunzel, or let go of the desire to stand apart. In a negative character arc, Cassandra would either try to hold Rapunzel back, or she would attempt to surpass Rapunzel so that Rapunzel needs her again. Assuming you've seen the show, I think you can already see what trajectories come into play. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Back to the Great Tree. Rapunzel wants to follow Adira's guidance, while Cass thinks she's dangerous, and Cass's job is to keep Rapunzel safe and she almost failed. I'm sorry, Raps. I'm supposed to protect you. But Rapunzel loses her temper and lays down the law. Adira stays. Cass is taken aback and hurt. Cass has history with Raps, and she expects that to mean something. As already said, there's been many times that Cass has warned Rapunzel about something or someone, and her instincts proved correct. But this Adira lady has shown up out of nowhere, and Raps is respecting her input, trusting her over Cass. Since when did you stop trusting my judgment? This is a huge confirmation of Cassandra's mentality that strength, power, is what is important if you want trust, respect, recognition. And this experience also waters the seed of doubt that her relationship with Rapunzel may not be as sisterly as Raps has insisted. But as a servant of the princess, I'm not a servant. Oh, I thought that's what a lady-in-waiting was. Yes, your highness. On top of that, everyone else agrees with Rapunzel about following Adira, which leaves Cass feeling completely disconnected. Whereas Varian's song comes after his traumatic event, Cassandra's comes before, and it perfectly encapsulates the growing pressure of these feelings of always being overlooked. The first lyrics of Waiting in the Wings are, Guess we all are born with parts to play. Some of us are stars, and some are just in the way. If you've seen Encanto and empathized with Mirabelle's pain, if you weren't always trying too hard, you wouldn't be in the way. Cassandra's emotional plight is little different. Seriously, I can absolutely hear Cassandra singing this. Oh. Cass 
things about how she just keeps trudging through life, doing her duty, waiting for her moment. But when her chances come, something prevents her from taking full advantage of them. And she ends up back as just a handmaiden. And the more it happens, the more it hurts. Just like Varian, sometimes this happens because of Cassandra's own choices, other times by the interference of others, or by a mix of both. And I point this out because it's good realism, narrative consistency, and narrative fairness, handling the characters equally. Cass vents her frustration through the song, but wraps it up with a resignation to keep on waiting for her chance to shine. Callie Star says this shows, Cass has already claimed defeat, but then immediately follows it up with, Still, Cass decides to keep on keeping on. I see this as a contradiction. I think it's fair to say that someone who has claimed defeat would quit at this point, but Callie Star admits that Cassandra keeps going. If Cass had really claimed defeat, she would stop waiting and just accept it as a lost cause. I was re-watching Moana with some friends, and spoilers, near the end, after Maui takes off and Moana returns Tefiti's heart to the ocean just to shortly thereafter retrieve it, someone commented that it was a bit unbelievable that she'd give up and then get back to it so quickly. But I responded that she didn't really give up. When given the option to return home, which would be truly giving up her quest, she didn't do it. She hadn't quit yet. She just suffered a moment of self-doubt. And like Moana, Cass here is suffering from self-doubt, but she's not a quitter, which is a character trait that comes into play even after her betrayal. But we'll get to that later. The important thing here is that Cass hasn't reached her trigger yet, but the groundwork has been laid. All she needs is something to push her to start down one of the possible character arc trajectories. To sum up, we have an emotionally guarded deuteragonist with big dreams of making a beneficial mark on the world, but her significant abilities are largely unrecognized, leaving her feeling distrusted and disconnected. Since she is in almost every episode, we spend plenty of time with her, getting to see several layers of setup slowly build until something breaks the camel's back. Let's talk about those breaking moments, the traumatic events that trigger each character's turn to villainy, starting again with Varian. Callie Star points out the tonal change of the episode Queen for a Day, and it's something I noticed as well. Well, most of the first two seasons, and a bit of the third, were fun and wacky adventures, and then suddenly the tone jumps into dramatic plot progression in the last third of the season. The Queen for a Day arc is only the third time we are ever seeing Varian, and his relationship with his father is strained. I want to note that trust and respect are big themes throughout the series, and Rapunzel, Cassandra, and Varian all have conflict with their fathers, wherein they want to be trusted with responsibility and respected as capable individuals. When that is withheld, in each case because their father wants to protect them, they feel disconnected, and it pushes them to rebel. Coincidence? I think not! In Queen for a Day, Kieran wants Varian to stay away from the rocks, so he lies to Varian, saying that he plans to tell the king about the problem. But Varian witnesses as Kieran then lies to the king, claiming that they need more land due to a bountiful harvest. As a result, Varian is left feeling confused and even more disconnected from his father, but he tells Rapunzel about the problem. Now, Callie Star says that Rapunzel promises, She'll protect old Corona and she'll never let anything bad happen to him. And I guess you could argue that can be inferred, but it's definitely not what Rapunzel actually promises. She just reassures Varian that she hasn't forgotten about their agreement, in episode 8, to figure out the mystery behind the rocks together. She just asks that he wait a day or two. I just want to point it out because it's one of those moments where Callie Star isn't necessarily wrong, but she's certainly not being accurate about the facts. At home, Varian continues experimenting in secret, once again ignoring the risks even as his first attempts literally blow up in his face. But his persistence never wavers. Unfortunately, when Kieran catches him in the act, Varian spills his latest concoction all over the rocks, and a strange amber substance starts growing from from it. Kieran saves his son from getting caught in it, but ends up trapped himself. And Varian hurries to Rapunzel since he knows she's somehow connected to the rocks. And he's convinced she's the only one who can help. 
Besides, she promised she would. As he hurries along, he sings Let Me Make You Proud, which in terms of tone and pace feels rather out of tune, pun intended, with the urgent context. But the lyrics? perfectly encapsulate his struggles and motivations. Callie Starr says that his song just tells us what we already know, but The song still serves some importance in making an emotional connection with the viewer and adding more sympathy to Barian's character, as well as being repurposed as a scary version for the reprise. Again, these points aren't incorrect, but they just come off as shallow. All she's got to say about it is that the song repeats information, tugs on heartstrings, and gets repurposed. And then when she talks about Cassandra's song, Waiting in the wings, she just sums it up as pretty much the depressed version of Let Me Make You Proud. The songs give the characters a chance to express their emotions in ways that speaking alone just cannot adequately capture. They poetically bear their souls to the audience, being much more explicitly honest than we've seen. Which, yes, can foster an emotional connection and inspire sympathy. But they also serve to establish a point in the progression of the character and story. As I said, Cass's song establishes that there is a growing longing for something more in her life, and she just needs that triggering event to push her into taking action. And I want to add that Waiting in the Wings also gets meaningfully repurposed. Not only when we learn that she's been singing this song since childhood, but also after she takes the Moonstone. Rapunzel begs her to wait, and it's a trigger that pushes Cass further into her decision. So before another line gets crossed and everything we've had is lost, just wait. Wait? No, I won't wait. Yes! But does Callie Star note that? Of course not. In regard to Varian's song, the lyrics end on this idea that he's going to return home a hero, and his dad will finally be proud of him. Everything is going to be sunshine and roses. It's leaning into his naivety and setting him up for a horrible letdown. Both songs are important, and they show again just how similar the characters are, since they are both singing about how they know they are capable of greatness and they just want others to recognize that. Callie Star does note that similarity, but still dismisses Cass offhand, instead of looking deeper. Anyway, back to Varian. Based on the maps we see and the other times characters journey back and forth, the trip from Varian's home to the castle seems to be several miles, probably a few hours of walking, and he's traveling through an unnaturally severe blizzard the whole way. When he gets to the castle, Rapunzel takes him aside to hear him out, but she explains to him that they are in the middle of a crisis and she can't help him right now. He even hears Nigel say that it's because of the storm. Then there's the hours-long trudge back through the worsening storm shortly thereafter. Now what bothers me about all of this is how he doesn't factor in the storm as a legitimate concern for Rapunzel to prioritize. It's just a bit too much for my suspension of disbelief. If his trip to Rapunzel were shorter or more sheltered, I could be persuaded to believe that blinded by his worry, he hardly even notices the storm. But he's trudging right through the thick of it for a considerable amount of time. We see him having to actively problem solve his way through it. How does it not affect his considerations at all? Not in the sense that he'd be willing to wait since his need is very urgent, but in the sense that he wouldn't hold it against her as harshly later on. I do want to note that Callie Star says Rapunzel turning away Varian is a really great scene that provides some important development not only for Varian, but for Rapunzel as well. But she never explains what she thinks those important developments are. She just says they got some and moves on. I agree that it's an important developing moment. It really shakes Rapunzel and of course leaves Varian desperate and alone. But why doesn't Callie Star talk about these points that she raises? This is supposed to be an analysis for the sake of learning how to write good character arcs. But she just vaguely mentions moments like these and offers no insight. How is this an analysis? How are we supposed to learn anything from this? 
When Varian gets home, he finds Kieran completely encased in the amber. So even if Rapunzel had come back with him immediately, it would have been too late. But Varian promises to get his father out and swears vengeance on those who stand or have stood in his way. Callie Star says, This shift could have easily gone wrong since it is a very dramatic character change. But we think it did go wrong. Varian's traumatic, triggering event is that his father gets encased in amber. But there are a couple things that just don't add up. First, keep in mind that what we've seen after Varian's previous bad experiences is that he simply tries to resolve the problem, usually in a bit of a panic. And when he fails, he becomes downcast. We've never seen him get angry or lash out at others. Second, as I said earlier, there were obvious extenuating circumstances behind Rapunzel's decision. His dad wasn't the only person in danger that day. Third, Rapunzel did say that she couldn't help right now implying she could help later. And thus far, Varian has been relentlessly persistent, despite being mostly unsupported. But now he experiences a single temporary rejection and he just immediately gives up, never considering to return later and ask Rapunzel once more for help. We believe Varian is forced out of character to make his twist villainy happen, which is where we think the shift went wrong. His established character is a boy who is not prone to angry outbursts. He cheerfully perseveres. He is compassionate, even to pests. We have a bit of a critter problem out here, and I have found a humane way to solve the problem. He is caring and eager to help others, but then he pulls a complete 180. He doesn't care about anyone else's needs, he immediately gives up on getting help, and he's maliciously bent on getting vengeance. We did not see anything in his establishment that would lead us to believe that this makes sense for his character. And the thing is, he's not the only one who goes completely out of character for this twist to work. We all know how important promises are to Rapunzel. It was a key character trait in the movie that significantly impacted the story. And now, suddenly, it means nothing. Yes, in the moment, Rapunzel had to prioritize the kingdom's crisis over Varian's problem. That's not what I'm talking about. Once the crisis has passed, Rapunzel does not follow up with Varian. The writers don't always give clear indications as to how much time goes by between episodes, but based on some fan-made timelines I found, it's possible that up to three months go by before Varian comes back into the story. So for up to three months, Rapunzel just shrugs off a friend who was desperately begging for her help after she promised to help. And he told her that his dad was in immediate danger, being encased by the rocks. At the end of that episode, as well as in the next one, she even brings up how much it bothers her that she had to turn her back on him. Why doesn't she follow up, send Cass or Eugene if she can't go herself? This doesn't make any sense for her character. But Callie Star doesn't mention any of this. She talks about how sympathetic villains or good guys turn bad are always an incredibly stressful balancing act in writing because you need both sides of the moral conflict to be arguable, but one to be ultimately the most agreeable in the end. And to be honest, with Varian, they knocked it out of the park. However, she doesn't explain what she thinks each side of the moral conflict is for Varian. We would, of course, explain what we think the conflict could be, but we're not going to do her work for her. The point is that she, again, doesn't explain. She makes many statements like this, but doesn't expound or back up her claims. She just moves on. In this case, she immediately continues with, Every box is checked off with no problems. There's a proper setup to Varian's rebellion against society. He was always an outcast, but even though this all adds up to a pretty crappy life, it's not enough to declare war on an entire kingdom. So you do the oldest writing trick in the book and kill the dad. Okay, first of all, suggesting that if you're stuck, just use a cliche is not good writing advice. Second, Kieran is not dead. That is categorical historically false. And if she's implying that Varian believes him to be dead, A, it'd be great if she clarified when she's speaking from the character's perspective, and B, I'm pretty sure Varian doesn't believe he's dead, which we'll touch on in a moment. But even aside from that, Callie Star isn't making much sense. Right after saying Varian is an outcast, she includes aspects of the triggering event, conflict with his dad and Rapunzel turning him away, as part of the setup to the triggering 
triggering event where conflict with his dad leads to the Amber issue and Rapunzel turns him away. So her only real point for Varian's proper setup is that he was always an outcast. And while we didn't see evidence that he was always an outsider, we will grant that that is the root of his turn. What happens to his dad is just the trigger. His betrayal isn't really about that. It's about how no one came to help. He feels abandoned. Everyone turn their back on me. I have asked for help and have been ignored. I tried asking for help in a civil manner, but was denied by everyone in Corona. But there needs to have been something ahead of time to show that his response, this cold-hearted, malicious behavior, was just under the surface, waiting for a trigger. Now, especially in the moment, we could understand how he wouldn't be thinking clearly, and would thus blame shift to Rapunzel. The rocks are connected to her, and she promised to help and then didn't. But given his established character, we don't see how that turns into... Especially when you consider that Varian's goals include making his father proud. I will make you proud. Get the answers and set you free. What we see of Kieran is a man who values peaceful living and is a personal friend of the king. Kieran, my old friend. So what motivates Varian to think that his father would be proud of doing whatever it takes, including threatening and endangering others and betraying the king, to free him from the Amber? That doesn't make sense to me. It's giving me the same vibes as this nonsense. And I will finish what you started. Varian himself later points out the problem with this. All I ever wanted was for my father to be proud. Of course, if he were free from the Amber now and saw everything I've done, well, he'd be ashamed. But it's these goals of freeing his father and making him proud, which convince me that Varian does not believe his father is dead. Granted, he isn't certain of him being alive. His exclamation of relief and excitement when Kirin is finally released makes that clear. But the fact that Varian is not just looking for vengeance says to me that he has a firm hope that his father is still living, which means that Callie Star repeatedly implying that Varian believes his father is dead is a misrepresentation. So thus far, we think that the two greatest weaknesses of Varian's negative arc are the lack of time and how his his response to the trigger just feels completely out of character. We have a few ideas for how we would have liked to see his arc play out, which we believe would fix these issues, but we'll share that near the end of the video. Right now, let's talk about Cassandra's triggering event. Right after Cassandra finishes singing Waiting in the Wings, the group is attacked. Rapunzel starts using the Wither incantation in order to take out their opponent, but last time she used it, she lost control of herself and almost killed all of them. So for her safety and theirs, Cassandra begs Rapunzel not to go dark mode. Cass sees a solution, a magical spear which she can use to defeat their foe, but Rapunzel insists that her going dark mode is the only way out of this. Once more, as Cass sees it, refusing to trust her. Sure enough, Rapunzel gets stuck in dark mode. Cassandra defies her orders to leave, instead rushing to her side and trying to help snap her out of it. She touches Rapunzel's arm, and in a horrifying moment, Cassandra's hand gets shriveled. When talking about Varian's dad getting stuck in the amber, Callie Star notes in a serious tone how that would be the breaking point for most people. And because Varian is 14, it's not a surprise that he goes a little crazy. But here, she makes jokes about Cassandra's crispy hand. Cass reaches out to stop Rapunzel and... Oops. Rapunzel tries to help Cass in her crispy hand. As already stated, we agree that what happened to Varian was traumatic, especially when you factor in his age. We simply think that his resulting malicious desire for revenge does not match up with his character establishment and how things led up to that moment. But for Callie Star to minimize Cassandra's trauma just because she doesn't like the character arc is not cool. If she had just said, I don't think this was a good writing choice, and then backed that up with some sort of explanation, it wouldn't bother us. 
but she downplays what Cassandra went through in order to support her biased argument that Varian is the better written character. And this dismissiveness only gets worse as her video continues. She calls the resulting tension between Rapunzel and Cassandra some classic, painfully familiar girl drama, complaining that Rapunzel and Cassandra both feel misunderstood by the other party, yet they refuse to talk to each other. The thing is, Rapunzel did briefly try to talk about it right after it happened, but Cass snapped at her and put up walls. Are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. Are you sure? I said I'm fine! Not to mention, even before then, Cass had tried to explain to Rapunzel how she felt sidelined. Since when did you stop trusting my judgment? But Raps didn't seem to really listen. Cass already finds it difficult to speak openly about how she feels. I don't do touchy-feely. The thought of opening up makes me queasy. Well, maybe it's not as easy for everyone to say how they're feeling. And it doesn't help when her attempts seem to fall on deaf ears. Of course, it's not that Rapunzel doesn't care. It's just that she doesn't really understand the full depth of the issue. Her fault is ignorance, not apathy. But right after complaining that the girls refuse to talk it out, Callie Star contradicts herself again, and admits that they actually do try to discuss it. It just takes a while since their first attempts don't go well. Which, to me, looks like good writing. Tough conversations are, well, tough. Sometimes it takes a few tries to get it right. And while putting in the effort to communicate makes a difference, talking it out doesn't always end with the problem actually resolved. Deep emotions don't just disappear at the drop of a hat. It takes time to work through such things. This is realism. It adds depth to character interactions. But again, Callie Star only seems to be looking at these surface level details. She goes on to comment that the conversation the two girls have at the end of Rapunzel day one never really matters in the end because immediately after in the next episode, everyone's back to hating on Cass again. I need to point this out. In context of the clip she's showing, this is not the next episode. This is the beginning of the episode she just talked about. In the actual next episode, Mirror Mirror, everyone is hating on everyone. They're all getting on each other's nerves from being stuck together. Callie Star is completely misrepresenting the content again. Even if I disregard the misleading visuals, I might go so far as to say she's lying. Cass is not in any way being singled out in the next episode. Things seem to have gone back to normal. Look, Raps, I can see where this is going. You're going to say something like, that shell house looks like a warm, dry place. And then I say, let's not rush into anything. We should be careful. Uh, and they're gone. I'm telling you, it just doesn't make sense. Look, Cass, I know this is weird, but you got to admit, this isn't the weirdest thing we've seen on the road. Cass still finds her advice being disregarded. She's still stuck in a role that frustrates her. And then... She's given a way out. But we'll get back to that in a moment. Because as Callie Star continues, she goes on a side tangent about Rapunzel, saying, At this point, there have been so many warning signs about Cass's vengeance that it seems like the whole thing should be blatantly obvious. But for some reason, when Eugene confronts Rapunzel about the prediction, she's like, No way, why would Cass ever do something like that? Okay, I get it that Rapunzel isn't perfect, and I'm sure she's got a lot on her plate right now, but this is just getting ridiculous. Ridiculous. Okay, this prediction Eugene gets comes one episode after Cass found out about her past and decided to betray Rapunzel. So how exactly have there been so many warning signs? Yes, there have been warning signs that their friendship is on rocky ground, but A, they recently seem to patch things up, and B, Rapunzel's character is one who always sees the best in others. And thus far, she's always been right about Cass. Cassandra's good nature always won out in the end, through each of their conflicts. And even in the midst of their final battle, you can see it's still there. But we'll get to that later. It would be completely out of character for Rapunzel to suddenly start suspecting her best friend, someone she views as a sister, is going to betray her. Especially since they seem to have reconciled and Cass still appears to be supportive. Also, yes, there is a lot on the plate right now. Think about Rapunzel-topia and how badly Rapunzel wanted the easy life that dream offered. Everything is perfect here, so why would I come with you? If you don't, it could literally be the end of the world as we know it. 
Well, maybe I don't want that responsibility. Maybe I just want to be happy. Even further back in Freebird, she says, These rocks are my destiny. And that's terrifying. What if they lead to somewhere I'm never supposed to come back from? She's under a lot of stress. It's a reasonable, realistic decision to get the higher priority stuff out of the way first, and then work on getting the friendship back on solid ground. Which isn't to say that her friendship with Cass is a low priority, but keep in mind that, as far as Rapunzel can tell, a huge factor in the strain on this relationship has been this quest. Ever since we left Corona, she's been different. So getting it completed would seem like a logical first step in getting her relationship with Cass back on track. But Callie Star continues, Why is Rapunzel being so negligent towards Cass? Why is Rapunzel still unable to at least recognize that Cass is upset with her, even if she can't solve their conflict? I'm not calling out Rapunzel here, I'm calling out the bad writing. Because to me, the writers are starting to exaggerate the naive obliviousness of Rapunzel so much that it feels out of character. Rapunzel may not have the greatest social skills, but one of her strong suits has always been understanding the feelings of others. First, I have to disagree agree with the assertion that Rapunzel's obliviousness is out of character, because understanding the feelings of others has always been one of her strong suits. Rapunzel absolutely is oblivious about these things. Her understanding comes after people spell it out for her, like in Challenge of the Brave. A friend wouldn't be so oblivious, Rapunzel. You have no idea what this contest means to me. As your friend, ugh. I should have realized how important this was to you. I'm so, so sorry. Or even in Great Expotations, Under Wraps, Big Brothers of Corona, Goodbye and Goodwill, Freebird, Beginnings, even Cassandra's Revenge. I thought a lot about how we left things and it makes me sad. Oh, it makes me sad too. I, I miss you, Cassandra. And those are just episodes where Rapunzel is oblivious to how Cass is feeling. There are several more episodes where Rapunzel just doesn't understand what's going on with someone else until it's explained to her. For pity's sake, remember how surprised she was when she found out how Varian felt at the end of The Alchemist Returns? But Callie Star seems to have taken no notice of that. Second, as already said, Rapunzel does recognize that Cass is upset with her. Too bad there's not a open up to your best friend about the thing you guys are fighting about, Wand. Huh. What was that? Cass, I know you're mad at me. Cass, I need to talk about what we both know is going on between us. Which is why she pushes Cass to talk it out in Rapunzel day one. And after Cass explains her feelings and says she just needs time to get over still being mad about it, then Rapunzel respects Cass's need for time by not hounding her about it further. What else does Kelly Star want Rapunzel to do? Really, Kelly Star's complaint about the writing here is just another example of her bias. When Rapunzel neglected Varian after he came to her in clear distress, explicitly laying out the problem and begging for help, that was incredible writing, a sympathetic setup with no problems at all. Even as Raps broke her promise and continued to neglect him after the overwhelming event that forced her hand had passed. But when Rapunzel respects Cass's need for time and an overwhelming event is looming right in front of her, then she's being negligent, ridiculous, and out of character. Continuing her complaint, Callie Star lists a bunch of characters who Rapunzel helped become better, then says, Rapunzel has shown a much higher amount of patience to these people who are much more frustrating than Cass, so why can't she handle a small bump in their friendship? I really don't understand how someone who has shown high consideration for others' feelings in the past could suddenly lose that skill when trying to fix a minor conflict in her relationship with her best friend. First of all, just a minute ago, Callie Star said that Cassandra's planned betrayal should be obvious, and the writers are exaggerating Rapunzel's obliviousness to make this work. And now she's saying that the whole thing is a small bump in the road, a minor conflict. Once again, contradicting herself. Second, Rapunzel's relationship with the characters Callie Star listed wasn't nearly as deep as her relationship with Cassandra, and it can be a lot harder to 
think rationally when a problem hits closer to home. This was literally part of the argument Callistar used to defend Varian. His dad died, so it made sense for him to go crazy. And as I already said, as far as Rapunzel knows, they have reached as good a resolution as they can right now. Cass just needs a little more time to process because, lastly, this is not a small bump or minor conflict. The two girls have had those before. This is something much bigger. Cassandra's hand got shriveled because Rapunzel made a bad call that Cass warned her against. And as far as they know, it can't be healed. Once again, Callie Star is minimizing Cassandra's trauma in order to argue that her character arc is bad writing but it gets worse. The audience learns in the beginning of season three what Cassandra's triggering event was, how she found out in the House of Yesterday's Tomorrow the truth about her past, that she's Gothel's biological daughter, but Gothel abandoned her at a young age to go live with Rapunzel. And regarding this, Callie Star says, Apparently, this was enough to convince Cass that Rapunzel has been ruining her life since day one. Even though Cass barely even knew Gothel as this information was a shock to her, and the life she did have with Gothel was simply acting as a child slave for her. I am trying really hard not to get angry. But this is completely undermining the very real trauma of children in Cass's situation. She acts like Cass is stupid for not recognizing that her mother didn't have her best interests at heart. She was a four-year-old child. Little kids think the world of their parents, and in abusive situations, the sad reality is that children think the way they are treated is normal, or worse, earned and childhood trauma can affect a person for life. But apparently, Callie Star doesn't consider child abuse as valid trauma because, in her opinion, it's not properly tragic and it happened too long ago. But even if I put that aside, Callie Star is just ignoring all the buildup to this triggering event. There are clear moments in pretty much every episode that Cass is a prominent character, as we discussed in the section on her establishment. But even in episodes where she's not as prominent, you can spot small moments that lend to the underlying issue. And all these things stack. This reveal for Cass was just the final nail in the coffin for the idea that has been stewing in the back of her mind for years. The idea that she is constantly a step behind Rapunzel. She is always in Rapunzel's shadow. No matter how hard she tries, Rapunzel will always supersede her just by existing. Seriously, rewatch Challenge of the Brave. Cass is constantly being overshadowed by Rapunzel, and Rapunzel isn't even trying, but Cassandra's pouring her whole heart into it. And then listen to the beginning of her song, Crossing the Line. And I've done the best I could, but I've always known just where we stood. Me here with the luckless, you there with the blessed. And that line between the beggars and the choosers is a line you never let me quite ignore. It perfectly encapsulates what we've been saying is her emotional struggle, the smoldering fuel that Xantiri ignites to trigger her betrayal. This moment is Cass's trigger. You've always felt outshined by Rapunzel, haven't you? And you always will, unless... Unless? It's the moment when Cass's mentality shifts from I've been a step behind Rapunzel to I've been kept a step behind by Rapunzel. Not by her intention, but by her mere existence. My whole life I've been cast aside for you. No more. Cassandra, I understand. You've been feeling like, like no one ever gives you a chance. And that is my fault. And here's the kicker. The beginning of the finale arc explicitly spells out Cassandra's motivations. You see, her whole life, Cassandra has felt second best. Going back to when her own mother, Gothel, chose Rapunzel over her. And as a result, Cass has developed a, uh, a grudge. How did Callie Star miss that? Speaking of, 
Callie Star goes on to contradict herself again. And this is where the cracks and the foundation of Cassandra's betrayal start to show. The only motivation that we can really latch onto here are the incidents at the Great Tree, because those major incidents warranted a larger reaction and invoked more feelings of sympathy in the audience. Otherwise, what other sympathetic motivations can we find here? Just moments ago, Callie Star was calling the Great Tree incident a small bump in the road, a minor conflict, painfully familiar girl drama. And now it warranted a larger reaction and invoked more feelings of sympathy. Not to mention her bias is showing again. When Varian blame shifted, Callie Star spoke of it as flawlessly sympathetic motivation for his betrayal. But when Cassandra blame shifts, it's not good enough. We need a better, more sympathetic reason to latch onto. To be clear, it does not matter if Cass does not consciously remember her mother. Trauma never goes away. It shapes people to their core. And when trauma is not recognized, it cannot be treated. I think that more than qualifies for a sympathetic motivation. But Callie Star continues to minimize Cass's experiences, summarizing them as follows. Rapunzel wasn't good at apologizing and is kind of annoying. Some people said some mean things to Cass a few times. Cass can't be the special. For those of you who don't know, the special is a reference to the Lego movie. You're the one the prophecy spoke of. You're the special. And the prophecy states that you are the most important, most talented, most interesting, and most extraordinary person in the universe. But if we look at these moments through Cassandra's perspective, like Callie Star loves to do with Varian, then it looks a little different. Sorry won't heal her hand, and Rapunzel still didn't really understand or appreciate how Cass has been feeling, despite her attempts to explain it. This has to stop now. This thing where you think that you've been my friend and don't even hear how you condescend the way you've always done. Other people showed her no respect. They treated her as the angsty help rather than the strong and independent woman that she is. She felt a lack of respect and appreciation from everyone around her for years. A feeling that stemmed from childhood trauma that she just didn't consciously remember. When she's singing Waiting in the Wings in season two, she's not singing that from, from nothing. She's, she's reminiscing a tune that she associates with being second best. And that's the heartbreaking part of that song is that it's not necessarily about Rapunzel as much as it is about her feeling disconnected from her mother and wanting to have that um, place in her mother's heart. But after misrepresenting Cassandra's pain as petty, Callie Star claims, These motivations warrant giving the offender the silent treatment for a few days, not stabbing them in the back and threatening to destroy their entire kingdom. Now, of course, we agree that threatening to destroy an entire kingdom is not an appropriate response. But note that she makes this comment directed only at Cassandra, not Varian, who also suffered trauma, but that still does not warrant threatening innocent people. Speaking of Varian, Callie Star again brings him up for comparison, saying, This poor 14-year-old kid already had a pretty crappy life, but then his entire world was flipped upside down at the hands of his best friend in a single day. Of course he's going to be mentally wrecked and make some bad decisions. I could say the same thing about Cass. She already had a pretty crappy life. As a child, she was abused and abandoned abandoned by her mother, then she felt unrecognized and unappreciated, constantly being left behind the scenes without an opportunity to really shine. Finally, she learns the truth of her past, and her entire world is flipped upside down in a single day, seemingly because of her best friend. Of course she's going to be mentally wrecked and make some bad decisions. The reality is, every time Callie Star says stuff like this, she's not making an analytical point about writing sympathetic characters. She's just pulling the sympathy card to excuse Varian's actions while vilifying Cassandra for similar behavior. She's just showing her bias. 
Before we get into talking about the villain arcs, I just want to say, if you've watched this far and are appreciating the content, please leave us a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more such content. You can also support our channel on Patreon. That would seriously mean the world to us. We put a lot of effort into our videos and receiving income for this work would be such an encouragement. But even leaving us a comment below or sharing our videos around is a great help to the channel and we'd really be grateful. Thank you so much and now we'll get back to it. Let's move on to the character's villainy, their good intentions with bad actions. As usual, we'll start with Varian. Kalistar says that even when Varian is a villain, he's not overly evil at first. He really does just want his dad back, and if that means pulling some strings and committing some treason, that's just what he's gonna have to do. It's only when Rapunzel and the rest of Corona push back that Varian is forced further down this dark path in order to achieve his goals. First of all, note how she's downplaying Varian maliciously tricking people into taking mind-affecting substances, and him taking advantage of Rapunzel's goodness to manipulate her into committing treason with him. And she's ignoring that his stated goal is not only to free his father, but get revenge. I will make you proud, get the answers and set you free, and I swear right now, they will pay. And after you freed your father? After? Oh, well, I'm afraid Corona will pay for turning their backs on me. And then there's one of those moments that uncomfortably sounds like victim blaming. He was forced into this if Rapunzel and company hadn't pushed back against his mistreatment of them, he wouldn't have turned so evil. Not to mention, it isn't even accurate. Rapunzel and the rest of Corona only push back against Varian after he attacks them with an automaton, and then attacks again with an alchemically altered Rudiger, which enables him to take the queen hostage. Their actions don't push him further. The thing that does aggravate him further is his failure to free his father using Rapunzel's hair. So Callistar is misrepresenting the facts and victim blaming. One would hope she's speaking from what she thinks is Varian's perspective of the situation, but like we said at the beginning, she never clarifies when she's speaking from an external viewpoint versus a character viewpoint. So I can't tell if she thinks this is how it went, or is just suggesting that Varian thought it. Then she adds, And he falls further for the lie that the kingdom is out to get him and his father. But this lie she mentions hasn't been established at all. Right before the Amber encasement incident, Varian witnessed his father's interview with King Frederick, where the king addressed Kieran as an old friend and granted his request for more land with no questions asked. Varian has already embraced a lie, that he's on his own in this mess, that he was abandoned. That's why he turned villainous in the first place. Rapunzel chose the kingdom over him and he selfishly believes that she chose wrong. She can't be relied on, no one can. He believes he's got to solve this on his own, and if others suffer in the process, well, serves them right for ditching him. But nowhere do we see evidence that he thinks the kingdom is out to get him and his father. He's not acting in self-defense, he's getting revenge. But whatever I've done, you deserve. Very and quiet. I'm the bad guy, that's fine. It's no fault of mine, and some justice at last will be served. Please listen. So I have no idea where Kelly Star came up with her idea that Varian thinks the kingdom is out to get him and his father. And she certainly doesn't see fit to explain herself. She then goes on to say, Varian really is just a kid living in a bad situation, and he just lost his only chance at escape from it. What was his only chance of escape from it? Callie Star never explains what she means by that either. It could be his father, it could be Rapunzel. We really don't know. What's more, she seems to be trying to justify his villainy rather than explain why it's well written. She continues, And okay, I'm not saying he should have threatened the entire kingdom in bringing out the Eva was a little much, but Varian's got some valid points. This king is really, really stupid. Again, she is majorly downplaying the severity of Varian's actions. Also, she doesn't explain what she thinks Varian's valid points are. And yes, some of what she goes on to say here about King Frederick 
is valid, but a bunch of it is just dumping on a character to prop up the one she likes. She's just shifting the blame for Varian's behavior onto someone else, something we've seen before in another fandom. She rants about how the king took the sun drop flower to heal his wife, regardless of the consequences, and how he was overprotective of his child who was kidnapped as a baby, which as a side note we see has left him seriously traumatized. Child. Rapunzel. Rapunzel, in the two decades you were gone, not once did your father sleep through the night. Your absence haunted him every minute of every day. But since his actions ultimately led to the Black Rock problem, Callie Star acts like Varian's situation is all the king's fault. What Callie Star is ignoring is that the king was really just making bad choices out of good intentions just like Varian. Once again, Callie Star is showing her bias. Yes, King Frederick holds some responsibility for the Black Rock situation, and is definitely to blame for his neglect of old Corona. And he does eventually acknowledge that responsibility. But in this situation, he is a victim of Varian's misplaced anger over Kieran being encased in the amber. So this is another example of Callie Star victim blaming. Then it turns out Rapunzel can't help Kieran. Varian's only working theory for how to fix the problem has failed. He's understandably devastated. And this is a key character moment. He's been brought to a point where he has to reassess and decide where to go from here. He can choose to recognize how his actions help lead to this and express remorse, rebuild what's been broken. Or he can, like Macbeth, decide that if he's gone this far, he may as well keep going. This is the moment he refers to later when he He's confronting Cass. Till you lose complete control and realize there's nothing left to lose. In his grief, Varian decides that this whole situation is Rapunzel's fault. And if he can't have a happy ending, then she doesn't deserve one either. So he tries to literally kill her family, her friends, and her. Any good intentions he had before are clearly gone now. But Callie Star completely skips over that. Rapunzel is pushed to the point where she has to take hold of the Black Rocks and wield them against Varian. But even as he's taken away, Varian still sees with a desire for vengeance. Callie Star's summary of this moment makes the king sound like a total jerk for apprehending the person who threatened the lives of his family and his people and shows no remorse. And so season one ends with Varian being seriously messed up on the inside and the king's like, ew, get this peasant out of my face. It's worth noting that this is a complete misrepresentation of the king's attitude at this moment. Don't be too hard on him, Dad. I'll be sure to do everything I can to get him help. As for Kieran, I'll not give up until I find a way to free him. He can see that Varian is seriously messed up inside and needs help, and he expresses a desire to get him help. But Callie Star chooses to frame him as the bad guy here because she blames him for the whole situation instead of acknowledging Varian's shortcomings. At what point does bias cross the line into willful ignorance? asking for a friend. She summarizes Varian's corruption arc by saying, Everything is handled with a lot of care, and it creates a well-done arc that acts as an amazing season finale. Later adding, The writers gradually invested the viewers in his character by showing his unfortunate circumstances, building up a sympathetic relationship between fan and character. Then they ramped the sympathy up to a thousand by tragically killing off Varian's father at the hands of Rapunzel, leading to an emotional conflict between the two as Varian repaid Rapunzel's betrayal. Yeah, you heard that right, folks. She just straight up claimed that Rapunzel killed Varian's dad, and Varian was just repaying her in kind. If that's not a direct lie and victim blaming, I don't know what is. And there's only so many times that a person can say stuff like this without any sort of clarification of what perspective they're speaking from before I start thinking they really believe what they're saying especially when they word it more strongly each time they bring it up. I want to believe that Callie Star is just speaking from Varian's perspective, but I'm not so sure anymore that she is. And again, what she's saying is just another appeal to emotion. 
we could say pretty much exactly the same about Cassandra. The writers gradually invested the viewers in her character by showing her unfortunate circumstances, building up a sympathetic relationship between fan and character. Then they ramped up the sympathy to 1000 by revealing Cassandra's tragic backstory, leading to an emotional conflict between the two girls as Cassandra wrestles with what this information means to her. Yeah, it sounds really deep, but if it's not backed up by evidence, it's meaningless. Since Kelly Star includes it in her video, we'll talk a bit about Varian's redemption arc later, but here we just want to summarize our thoughts regarding his negative arc. In an interview, Chris Sonnenberg talks about how most of the main points of the story were already planned out before Varian even came into existence, but they needed an antagonistic character to force Rapunzel to stop running from her destiny, to push her to grab hold of the Black Rocks. They needed to bring her to the point of no return so she would finally set out on her journey. That's why Varian was brought in and made the season 1 antagonist. Unfortunately, such a late inclusion doesn't leave a lot of room for a well-developed corruption arc. However, Kelly Star doesn't seem to be aware of this information, although it was available on YouTube a whole year before she posted this video. She even says at one point, I'm assuming partly as a result of Varian's success, the writers tried a very similar arc with Cassandra. Did she not do any research before writing her analysis? To us, Varian's arc looks like what it is crammed. There is barely any setup, the turn feels forced due to out of character behavior, and his villainy seems completely out of whack with his goal of making his father proud. The writers needed him to fulfill certain plot points, and he served his purpose. So on one hand, the story got what it needed, and that's good. But on the other hand, a character was relegated to being a plot device, and that's not so good. But Kelly Star claims this is how you're supposed to do a corruption arc. Let's talk about Cassandra's villainy now. Callie Star's main complaint is that, because of the setup, it's too weak to be the show's finale. Continuing her comparison with Varian, Callie Star says, The setup for Cassandra's turn to evil just isn't as strong as Varian's, and yet they try to drag it out for more than double the length of his villain run. There's your problem. Every time I analyze this arc, I always come back to this problem. It only works in short episodes, like we saw in season 1 and in the first half of season 2. Maybe it could even sustain the end of a season like Varian's did, but it should have never been forced to carry an entire season and the show's finale. The writing behind it is just not that strong. First of all, I'm pretty sure that she's never actually analyzed this arc. Second, this is part of the problem of claiming that a single execution of a writing aspect is what you're supposed to do. Because Callie Star treats Varian's complete completely rushed corruption, villainy, and redemption as the gold standard, then she considers spending time actually fleshing out a character arc to be dragging it out. But aside from the bias that is marinating everything Callie Star says, she's also forgetting Santiri. Cassandra's villain arc is tied up with her. If they rushed through Cassandra's arc, they'd be rushing the final boss as well. And this is what bothers us about Cassandra's arc. Cassandra's setup and turn, we believe, were well done as discussed. But we think her villainy isn't done as well, partly because it's entirely tangled, pun intended, with Zontiri, who we felt was a rather anticlimactic final boss. But we'll get back to her in a little bit and explain that. Another complaint of Callie Stars is that she believes Cass's villainous behavior is out of character because their personality is actually rather realistic and isn't prone to impulsive, emotion-fueled actions like the ones she's taking right now. However, we see Cass make several impulsive, emotion-fueled decisions over the course of the series. Her choices in Beginnings are a prime example. Similarly, her choices in Great Expotations or her taking part in the goodbye and goodwill competition, lying to raps in Rapunzel Day 1, using the idol in Happiness Is, and playing with the top in Are You Kidding Me? No way! I used to have a top just like this, I love these things! 
look at it go! <laughs> Cass is not emotionless. She's just guarded. And she's been living behind bars of her own creation for so long. Duty, responsibility, practicality, etc. I don't have time for dreams. And as Eugene says, There's a difference between setting feelings aside and burying them so deep they change who you are. Cass wasn't being herself, but she's finally broken out. So yeah, she's overcorrecting, being super impulsive now. She's not holding back anymore. And I'm done holding back, so look out, clear the track, it's my turn. I'm taking what's mine, every drop, every smidge. If I'm burning a bridge, let it burn, but I'm crossing the line. This is how character arcs work. You see a notable, logical change in the character's behavior after key events. It's not a 180 degree turn like Varian's. We've seen Cass act this way before. She's been competitive, status seeking, and self absorbed. She's hurt her friends because of that. She's just taking it to another level now. This isn't new, it's progressive. It's good writing. Callie Star's other complaint about Cass's villain arc is that it's repetitive. When it's not focusing on fantastical misadventures, season three becomes very repetitive. She gives a hypothetical comparison with Varian. What if Varian escaped before the guards could catch him, and the second season was spent hunting him down as he hid in the wilderness, raising another robot army? Wouldn't the whole thing start to get old after the 20th you killed my father speech? We would reach a point where Rapunzel would just be pleading with Varian to understand that she had to make a tough choice, and if she hadn't focused on the safety of the island, everyone could have died, not just Kieran. We find it interesting that Callistar seems to understand how Varian's prolonged grudge against Rapunzel just doesn't quite make sense, and yet she still argues that his turn was incredible and sympathetic rather than ridiculous and forced. And again, if the answer is because she puts herself in his shoes in these moments and tries to speak from his thoughts and feelings, then why doesn't she do that with Cassandra? It is absolutely valid, perhaps even necessary sometimes, to consider the character's perspective. But you need to make it clear when you're doing that, and you need to do it consistently for all the characters in question, not play favorites. Callie Star concludes her comparison, But Varian would refuse to understand all of this for no reason, because the arc would have to keep going to finish up the season. This is basically what they did with Cass. A few moments later. But every time Cass has even a trace of a doubt, this stupid little gremlin comes floating in and is like, But Rapunzel. So first she implies, that Cass has absolutely no reason to continue being villainous, and then she admits to one of the reasons Cass has to push back against Rapunzel's pleading. She's being manipulated. Once more, Callie Star is misrepresenting information and contradicting herself. On a side note, she talks about Xanteri a bit. Can we mention how terrible of a villain Xanteri is, by the way? They try to portray her as a cunning mastermind. She's not. They try to make her cute yet creepy. She's not. Basically, they try to make her impactful or memorable in any way, and she's just... Not. We do agree that Xanteri is not a very impactful or memorable villain, but it's worth noting that Callie Star doesn't explain or back up any of the points she makes about the character here. She just states, as if it is fact that the way she feels about the character is how the character is. You can't learn anything from this. This is not analysis. Later, she adds, It seems like the only reason she exists is to just give the story some sense of scale, and justify Cass's actions, at least in a way. Adding to her self-contradiction, she admits that Cassandra has more reason behind her betrayal besides what happened at the Great Tree. But she's also showing her lack of research again, since she's clearly just guessing at why Xanteri exists. I know it's a bit off-topic, but since Callie Star brought her up, let's talk a little bit about Xanteri. Chris Sonnenberg explains that, similar to Varian, Xanteri was created to serve a purpose for the plot. During development, they came to realize that they couldn't have Cassandra knowing from the start that she was Gothel's daughter. It would completely change the core of her character, so they needed someone to impart that information to her, and they added in Xanteri. But aside from that role, she wasn't important. Her story just didn't 
it wasn't as important. You know what I'm saying? Like okay. it was really about the about um, the best friends and the crew. And so giving Zontiri just a really vague like I want power mm -hmm. kind of thing, it made more sense to the to the plot to get off of any kind of emotional connection that Zontiri had to the crew. Uh, other than revenge, right. and then just give give again give Cassandra and Rapunzel the the heavy lifting of um, the emotional connection to the story. As we said about Varian, in a sense, this is good writing. It serves its purpose, but in a sense, it's not good writing. Characters should be people, not plot devices. It brings depth and richness to the story, and setting to give substance and dimension to each character who plays an important role in the story. But yeah, with Zantiri, there's not much to her. She just boils down to, I want power and I want to destroy Corona. Her motive for wanting power is just because. And her motive to destroy Corona is indirect. She doesn't actually care anything about Corona. She just wants to get back at Demanitus. And since he liked Corona, for reasons, she's going to destroy it. It's just vague. As well as disconnected from the characters we've been following throughout the series. The characters we're invested in. And because she spends most of her time tangled up with Cass's arc, we don't get a sense of character presence from Xantiri. And that, to me, is the key here. I think Xantiri's greatest weakness as a villain is that she doesn't feel like a real threat. In the stories where we first learn of her, all we hear about is her being defeated. Time after time. And when Raps and company periodically run into Xantiri's followers trying to bring her back, they defeat them. Her buildup is literally all failure. Heck, Rapunzel even mocks her for it. That old fool Demanitus would be proud of how far you've come, princess. To be clear, we are talking about the same old fool who outsmarted you and trapped you in oblivion for over two millennia, right? It doesn't lend a sense of intimidation. And though we are told she is a very powerful and dangerous sorceress, we never actually get to see that. As a spirit, all she does is follow Cass around, acting meek and mild. Even though we can see that she's clearly being manipulative, she doesn't feel particularly powerful or dangerous. All that's needed to stop her is for Cass to stop listening. Once she gets her body back and she can do more than just talk now, we don't really see her utilizing her sorcery. She uses a boomerang a bunch. <laughs> She uses a few magic artifacts from the spire, such as the shape-shifting cloak, the lamp of terror, and a teleportation ring. She takes a shard from Gothel's mirror, she pulls the shape-shifting cloak off of Cass, she pushes the button on Varian's amber launcher, she uses one of Varian's alchemical concoctions to free herself from Cass's cage, etc. The key moments of her scheming plots, she's primarily just using simple manual trickery, or else magic items. We see as much, if not more, sorcery from her followers in the few episodes they appeared in as we do from her over all of season three. By the time she finally drops all pretense and takes the sundrop and moonstone and resumes her demon form, I don't feel a real sense of foreboding or suspicion. What's she going to do that I haven't already seen? And sure enough, there's nothing new. Just more pointy rocks and using the wither incantation. It doesn't help that she still doesn't get much focus. The narrative is busy wrapping up Cassandra's arc, resolving things between the two girls. So yes, Xantiri is not an impressive villain, and she ends up dragging down Cass's villain arc as a result. But like Varian, she's necessary. The writers need a character to reveal the truth to Cass, to trigger her turn, to manipulate circumstances to push Cass further into villainy, and then to reunite the two girls against a common foe in the end. But enough about Xantiri. Let's return to Callie Star's complaint about season 3 being repetitive because of its focus on Cassandra. Here's the thing. 
Typical to the tonal shift of each season, Cass doesn't actually behave villainous until the last third of the season. Up until Cassandra's revenge, she's simply off doing her own thing way outside of Corona, trying to master her new abilities. However, in the first two thirds of the season, we see Cass several times, for just a minute or so each. And on the surface, it's usually a quick show of her struggling for control over the Moonstone powers and Zontiri utilizing her frustration to nudge her toward the darker path. If you examine each of these moments, you can see how they add depth and progression to the overarching plot, themes, and Cass's character arc, but they can feel repetitive, especially if you're just generalizing the content instead of, you know, analyzing it. In episode three, we see Eugene finally connecting to his dad, accepting his family, warts and all. And then we see Cass struggling alone, unable to do anything with the rocks, even though in the opening episode, she could control them effortlessly. In episode four, we hear Rapunzel assure Catalina that feeling angry isn't inherently bad. She just needs to express it appropriately. And the last thing we want is for you to bury your anger again. That never helped anyone. And then we see Zontiri coaching Cass to nurture her hatred and rage, saying it's necessary to wield the Moonstone's power. And sure enough, with great effort, Cass is able to call up some rocks. In episode seven, we see Rapunzel remembering the kind of person that Cass truly is and resolving to keep believing in her. But meanwhile, Cass is allowing her perception of Rapunzel to be twisted as Zontiri paints her as a thief and an enemy deserving of suffering for having stolen some of the Moonstone's power. In episode 10, Xantiri takes it up a level, telling Cass that it is her destiny to destroy Rapunzel in order to wield the power of both the Moonstone and the Sundrop. The thought that she must face Rapunzel to strike her down frightens Cass, and her fear unintentionally sends rocks exploding into Corona. Rapunzel and company, affected by the fear that the rocks radiate, must support and encourage one another in order to brave through the ordeal. They emerge successful, causing the rocks to regress. And Zantiri tells Cass that this is what Rapunzel will do to her if she doesn't act preemptively. So in episode 12, we see her and Zantiri Zontiri pursuing the Moonstone incantation in order to unlock more power. When they realize that they need the Demanitus scroll, Cass finally plans to return to Corona. Meanwhile, we see Rapunzel help Cassandra's father make peace with the past and learn the importance of sticking by your family through their struggles. Overall, this is actually quite beautiful. The creators juxtapose characters positively progressing with Cassandra negatively progressing to show rather than tell their young audience how Cassandra is going down the wrong path. You never get confused that this choice she made was actually the right one, a step she had to take to get what she wanted and needed. It's made very clear that her decision to betray others to get ahead is not improving her life, but making it worse, emotionally, morally, socially, etc. But getting back to what Callie Star has to say about Cass's villainy. The rules of writing would say that Cass carrying on this betrayal for so long would be out of character. But now the writers can just pass Pass the whole thing off as Xantiri's manipulation. What rules of writing? We don't know. She never says what these supposed rules are. And no, the writers are not passing off anything. Cass has been pushed beyond the point of no return now. She's not going to go back to waiting in the wings. Well, I'm not being patient anymore. As we touched on when talking about her setup, she's not a quitter. The path I'm on is a path paved in black. Taking that road and I'm not looking back. Zantiri's manipulations are not carrying the arc, just supporting it. It makes sense for Cass to keep pushing Rapunzel away because Rapunzel wants things to go back to how they were. This whole time I believed your place was here, in Corona, with me. But Cass wants things to change. I want you and the rest of the world to know that I come second to no one. She wants to stand apart, be someone who is no longer overlooked. Think about how happy she was while singing this. She thought she was finally chasing some grand destiny. 
What are you doing? I'm fulfilling my destiny. I thought by taking the Moonstone, my destiny would become clear. But Xantiri tells her that her destiny will only be achieved if she defeats Rapunzel, because otherwise Rapunzel will take away her power, her ability to forge her own way. She'll be forced back into a box. So yes, it does make sense for the betrayal to carry on. But Callie Star continues, And while yes, now the writing technically makes sense and technically isn't bad writing, that doesn't make it good either. You can follow all the rules and justify pretty much any occurrence in your story with some kind of logical reason, but that doesn't mean it's going to be engaging or challenging to the viewer. That's how I feel about the Mooncast arc. It only does the bare minimum. I'm sorry, are we really talking about Cass here? Or Varian? Because Kalistar justifies everything that happens in Varian's arc and claims it's great writing because it checks all the boxes of what you're supposed to do. Even though, as we've explained, it just does the bare minimum. The factors of the corruption arc formula she presented are present but they are not well executed. But speaking of her formula, we mentioned at the start that it can be argued that Cass technically does fit the equation, despite Callie Star saying that she doesn't. So let's address that now. We've already gone through how Cass has a sufficiently sympathetic setup and traumatic event, which just leaves good intentions with bad actions. The bad actions part is obvious, but not as obvious are the good intentions. As we've been saying, Cass wants to be recognized Recognized, to be respected. She wants to be free to make her own decisions, her own mark on the world, rather than just follow orders and stay in the shadows. There is nothing wrong or bad about wanting those things. Just because her intentions are for herself doesn't make them any less good. Of course, it doesn't justify her bad behavior. We're only saying that she fits the equation. Getting back to Callie Star's arguments, she once again minimalizes Cassandra's trauma, deeming it shallow. They just keep repeating the same issue about Gothel over and over again, and it seems like the writers think they can find something deeper there, but they really can't. Okay, first off, they don't actually harp on it as much as she makes it seem, but we'll expound on that later. Second, Callie Star is missing the point. Just like Varian's betrayal was triggered by his father's predicament, but the root of it wasn't really about his father, it was about him feeling alone and abandoned, in the same way, Cass's betrayal isn't really about her mom, it's about her feeling unrecognized and held back. But just like Varian keeps bringing up his dad as his motivation, Cass keeps bringing up Gothel as hers. And I think this adds an element of realism. It's often difficult to put into words the feelings and reasons behind why things trigger us, so we tend to focus on the trigger, which unfortunately often confuses the problem further. And because Callie Star wasn't looking too deeply into the content, she got confused. She thinks all Varian wants is to get his dad back, and Cass is only upset because of her mom. Neither is true. They are certainly significant factors, but they're not the be-all end-all. Callie Star goes on, saying, Rapunzel had no direct effect on this whole situation besides just existing. As we already pointed out, that's exactly why Cass is so pissed off. Just by existing, Rapunzel has displaced Cass. She never had to strive for the position of favor, respect, recognition that she has. She just got it. That's infuriating for someone who feels they had to strive for everything and still come up short. I want you to know what it feels like to fall short despite your best efforts. Which Incidentally, is precisely what Callie Star said made Varian's plight so sympathetic. The audience already has at least some pity for Varian. Everyone can relate to that feeling of putting in hours of hard work and effort only to come up just short of success. And we're all rooting for him to overcome this struggle. Yes. Her bias is showing, again. And then she says this. And if anything, she got the short end of the stick, as Cass at least got an escape from having an abusive sociopath as a mom. Yeah, I'm gonna let Alibi voice our thoughts on this. Trauma is not a fucking competition. Cassandra did have an abusive sociopath as a mom. She did not escape that just because she was abandoned as a child. Callie Star's attitude about this is just disgusting. And what's worse is that her disregard feeds into further dismissal from her viewers. Read the comments. Some of them are downright sickening. 
and she's in there supporting and encouraging this attitude. I wanted to see if other reviewers generally agreed with this mentality or not, so I watched the video by Hezu Neutral. And while I felt her review was far more insightful than Callie Star's, I was disappointed to find that she shared the same opinion of Varian vs. Cass. She posits that Varian's betrayal is well written because it makes sense for him to turn on Rapunzel after she's such a horrible friend to him. But like Callie Star, she's ignoring how completely out of character that behavior is for Rapunzel, which is a serious problem with the writing. Neither does she notice how out of character Varian's turn to villainy is, given his established traits, nor how his actions are out of alignment with half his goals. And then in regard to Cassandra's betrayal, Hezu Neutral argues that Cass his anger at Rapunzel came out of nowhere. As we've already detailed, it was well set up. And she also says that Cass's sympathy for Gothel as her mother just doesn't make sense because she's heard all these bad things about Gothel. There are a couple things to address regarding this argument. First of all, she includes things that Cass hears after her betrayal in A Tale of Two Sisters, which I don't think counts because at that point, as we've said, Cass doesn't want to go back to the way things were. Information like that is going to be denied especially when it seems that there's contrary evidence to its validity. Second, the thing about emotional abuse is that it can be tricky for outsiders to understand, especially when you're trying to explain the behavior of someone like Gothel, who was gaslighting hardcore. We, the audience, saw firsthand what Rapunzel's life with Gothel was like, the kind of person Gothel really was. Cassandra only heard about it. When you don't live in the day-to-day -day with an emotional abuser, you often can't see it. You weren't there. You have no idea. Think about if someone says, oh, you're such a sweet little thing. The tone is condescending and it makes you feel small and stupid. But when you try to explain that to someone else, your listener might wonder if you were just reading into it because you don't like that person and the words they spoke were perfectly fine. Or if someone said something that you found hurtful, but they passed it off as a joke. Again, when telling someone else this, your listener might wonder if maybe you were just being oversensitive, maybe the person was just joking. Now factor in that you also tell your listener that this person raised you, caring for you, teaching you, giving you good food, making your favorite recipes, giving you a comfortable place to live, nice clothes to wear, endless supplies for any hobby you took interest in, telling you on a regular basis how much they love you, etc. Doesn't that sound nice? Might your listener not wonder if you're just blowing the negative things out of proportion? Yes, you had to do housework, but that's normal. Every kid has to do chores. Also consider that to Cass, who was raised by the captain of the guard, who faced danger and the dark side of humanity on a regular basis, when Rapunzel goes on and on about all the things Gothel warned her about, a lot of it probably sounded like logical warnings. So Cass thinks, Okay, so Gothel was a little paranoid, but she was just trying to keep Rapunzel safe. And stabbing Eugene? Well, he was a wanted criminal scheduled to be hanged for his many crimes who earlier had broken into their home and taken off with Rapunzel. I mean, Cass probably heard enough from her father about Eugene that she would have gladly stabbed him herself at that time. So it seems the worst thing Gothel did was kidnap Rapunzel, but still from Cass's perspective, Look how Rapunzel turned out. Irrepressibly free-spirited, confident, optimistic, creative, kind, joyful, surrounded by loving friends and family, etc. All these enviable things that Cassandra is not, which she credits to her upbringing. So is it not possible that Cass might think that for the most part, Gothel was actually a loving mother to Rapunzel? And that if not for Rapunzel, then maybe Gothel would have wanted and loved Cass instead. Remember this line from The Incredibles 2? But why would your brother- Is a child. He remembers a time when we had parents and superheroes. So, like a child, Winston conflates the two. Mommy and Daddy went away because Supers went away. 
I think because of what happened with Gothel choosing Rapunzel because she had magic powers, similarly, Cass has conflated the two. Her mentality of power is how you get recognition is rooted in this. She thinks if she can get magic powers, people will finally choose her over Rapunzel. She thinks it will right the wrongs of the past. It's not sensible, of course, but it makes sense from Cass's character standpoint, at least to me. You can share your thoughts in the comments. But moving on with Callie's so-called analysis, she says, I'm glad that the writers noticed the similarities between Varian and Cass, as they face pretty much the same conflict of being underestimated by others throughout the show. The song is an interesting exploration of their characters, and makes good use of the fact that Varian has been in the same position as Cass. First of all, the writers didn't just notice the similarities, they created them. Secondly, Callie Star again acknowledged acknowledges that Varian and Cassandra have the same foundational struggle, but throughout her video she insists that Varian's reasons for turning were engaging and sympathetic, but Cassandra's were not. The song Nothing Left to Lose is pretty interesting because it highlights the common ground between Varian and Cassandra, and how Cassandra herself doesn't want to see it. But you and I, we're not her lyrics are sprinkled with some half-truths, but most of it is just her being in denial, trying to convince herself more than Varian. She's claiming that she's perfectly fine with the direction things are going, that it's exactly what she wants, and that her choices have made her stronger, and most importantly that she has, well, nothing left to lose. But as soon as Varian is gone, she doesn't sound so certain of herself anymore. Now I have nothing left to lose. But among her self-lies, there is one that is particularly interesting. Cass, trust me, becoming the villain isn't the answer. Is that what you think I am? Cass doesn't want to believe she's being villainous. As I said, her goal was simply to be free to chart her own course. But it's been twisted now into this confusing and frightening destiny. She didn't want to be a villain, and so she doesn't want to admit that that's what she's become. Just because I'm pursuing my destiny doesn't make me a bad person. Am I the bad guy? She only accepts it when she believes that that's how Rapunzel has come to see her. Because I'm scared she won't forgive me! You're right to be scared. This potion may be your only protection against the princess when she inevitably turns on you. Xanteri was right. Cassandra! You want me to be the bad guy? Fine. Now I'm the bad guy. When she believes that her best friend no longer thinks there's any good left in her, she believes it herself. Back to Callie Star, she again compares Cass's arc to Varian's, once more displaying her ignorance of the show's production as well as writing in general. With Varian's villain arc, they knew they couldn't use it for more than a few episodes before it would get repetitive, and their failure to do this with Mooncast is one of the main factors behind its downfall. First off, the writers created him and his arc as a catalyst for Rapunzel to begin her journey, and so it wasn't about avoiding repetition. They just didn't put much into him because they didn't want or need to. Second, note how she's claiming that Cassandra's arc failed because the writers didn't directly copy another character's arc from the same series, no less. This is horrible writing advice, resulting from her mentality that there's only one correct way to execute a particular aspect of writing. But Callie Star obviously didn't bother considering what the practical application of her writing rule would look like. Copycatting one execution of something would result in repetitive and dull stories which ironically is what she's claiming is the problem with Cassandra's arc. Speaking of which, Callie Star goes on to say, At this point, any emotional weight this conflict between Rapunzel and Cass held has been exhausted. It's just them repeating the same conversations over and over again, and it just keeps going, yet nothing special is added to keep the viewer's attention. So it was around this point in writing our script that I noticed a big issue with Callie Star's presentation here. Her points seem all mixed up. She's complaining about how the topic of Gothel has been exhausted at this point, 
but she's still just talking about the episode Cassandra's Revenge. Moments later, she gripes about how there's seven more episodes. So she's fudging everything together in a confusing mess, misrepresenting information again. The thing is, we've already broken down Cass's appearances in the first two thirds of the season, and the reality is that Gothel wasn't discussed much at all. She was brought up in the season opening when we saw what triggered Cass's turn, but then she doesn't really get mentioned again until Cassandra's revenge, where she's only briefly touched on. Then she isn't brought up again until A Tale of Two Sisters, where the girls discuss her more and you see that Cass still aches with that wound of being unloved by her mother. And then they don't talk about her anymore. Cassandra briefly talks about Gothel with Xantia at the beginning of Once a Handmaiden, but there's no further discussion of Gothel between Cass and Rapunzel. So claiming that the topic is exhausted is purely an exaggeration. To be honest though, originally I somewhat agreed with this point about Gothel being talked about too much. I too had that feeling that it was a bit redundant and the writers could have cut some stuff from that back and forth over Gothel between Cass and Rapunzel and Cass and Xantiri. But while writing this, I actually rewatched the series and I came to understand that A, it's not even remotely too much and B, I wouldn't want them to shorten it. This is deep rooted trauma that Cass is dealing with. And yes, Rapunzel suffered a lot of the same trauma. I'm not trying to diminish that in any way. But A, we're focusing on Cassandra here. B, different people can react to trauma differently. And C, perhaps more importantly, Everyone knows about Rapunzel's trauma. Pretty much everyone is patient and forgiving with her when she responds to triggers or doesn't handle a social situation the way most people would. But Cass? No one knows. So they don't cut her slack. They don't give an abundance of grace or patience to her. It's just one more example of Rapunzel getting something that Cass also really needs and Rapunzel never even had to ask. It all just piles up. You don't work through something like that in a single tidy conversation. One of the reasons I love watching Tangled the series with my young daughter is because they don't entirely gloss over ugly realities. Rapunzel has to deal with annoying people who stay annoying. She has to recognize that not everyone is going to like her and neither does she have to like everyone and that doesn't make them bad people. She has to weigh counsel and make tough decisions, and sometimes that results in bad outcomes. She has to take responsibility and problem solve. She has to face the unknown head on and persevere despite the scary and weird obstacles that life throws at her. She has to respect the agency and autonomy of her friends. She has to accept her own helplessness in situations she wishes she could resolve. She has to face her trauma and her friend's trauma, and it's not something that's easily fixed for either of them. She has to listen and reflect, learn and grow, and so much more. The show handles serious topics in an age appropriate way. It respects the intelligence of its young audience without forgetting their youth. Rapunzel is not perfect, but she is good. And with her as a role model, the show teaches a balance between the values of being open-hearted and cautious. It inspires maturity and kindness. And as a parent, I can watch it right along with my daughter and enjoy it. Tangled the Series is a fantastic kids show. Sorry, I just got caught up for a moment. Where were we? Well, Kelly Star was continuing with. We have this tale of two sisters. It sounds like this really epic fantasy storyline of an eternal conflict between good and evil. But in execution, it's just Cass spouting the same nonsense about Mother Gothel while Rapunzel just smiles and nods. Wow, this just keeps getting better and better. Now wrestling through emotional trauma is nonsense. And no, Rapunzel is not smiling and nodding. She doesn't treat Cassandra's pain as is invalid. Yes, she doesn't do or say all the right things, but she takes it seriously. She doesn't know how to make things better, but she wants to help her friend through this difficult time. She explicitly tells Cass this more than once, and it's also clearly expressed through her song I'd Give Anything. I won't pretend to know just what you're going through. Name any sacrifice I'll pay. Callie 
Jorah's attitude about all of this is... Ain't nobody got time for that! There's seven more episodes? Look, nothing significant happens in these episodes that change my mind about the arc. If anything, they reinforce to my negative feelings. And unlike TTS, I'd like to avoid being repetitive, so I'm just going to blanket them all as not very good. This is not analysis. How is it repetitive? Each episode introduces new information and keeps the story progressing toward the finale in a logical manner. Callie Star couldn't be bothered, but we'd like to take a proper look at the rest of Cassandra's villain arc. Cassandra's revenge shows that even though, yes, she is a villain now, she doesn't want to needlessly hurt others like Varian and Pascal. And I don't want to hurt you. Pascal! Are you here? Yeah, he's here. She doesn't even seem intent on pursuing the fight with Rapunzel, but after Xantiri pressures her into it, Cass turns darker, even threatening to kill Eugene. Of course, Xantiri first helped Varian unlock the final incantation to ensure that Rapunzel would have the ability to match Cass's power, supercharging the conflict and enabling Xantiri to assume her physical form. In Race to the Spire, Cass and Xantiri get the Mind Trap Stone, which is how the writers keep everyone else busy during the finale. We again see Cass saying that she doesn't want to hurt others, but her actions contradict that soon after, this time without any external pressure. Meanwhile, Zentiri gets into Rapunzel's head, making her question if her compassion could be a hindrance to the greater good. Your weakness, compassion. Some people would say that's a strength. <laughs> strength? No. Useful? Yes. Thanks for your compassion. Xantiri also assures that Rapunzel knows who she is and that she's manipulating Cass. With this, Rapunzel understands that the problem is bigger than Cassandra just losing her way, and thus may require a stronger response. In A Tale of Two Sisters, the girls are reminded how they're stronger together, but ultimately we see Xantiri tighten her grip on Cass. Cass becomes so distrustful and angry with Rapunzel that she's willing to leave Raps for dead. Rapunzel still clings to the hope that Cass will come back, but she can't deny anymore that Cass is quite lost and dangerous. So after Eugene becomes captain of the guard in Flynn Poster, then in Once a Handmaiden, Rapunzel greenlights Project Obsidian. Meanwhile, Cass finds the broken mirror shard, and it confirms that Gothel would not have loved her, even if Rapunzel hadn't entered the picture. Cass realizes who Xantiri is, and frightened at the prospect of becoming a villain like her, tries to reconnect with Rapunzel. I've got to fix this. The raw character dialogue in the play is just so good, but things go south due to Xantiri's meddling, and Cass ends up accepting her role as the bad guy. Fine, now I'm the bad guy. In the final episodes, we see that Xantiri has manipulated both girls into such a position that they will inevitably clash during the eclipse, which is when she knows Rapunzel will be weakened, and she can take both the Moonstone and the Sundrop for herself. But we are also shown that, just as Rapunzel believed, the good in Cass isn't completely gone, despite everything that's happened. Raps. I am so sorry. And that brings us to our final point, the positive character arcs that Varian and Cass both receive. Wrapping up her praise for just how great Varian's villain arc is, Callie Star says, The show only continued to deliver when they addressed his fallout one season later, giving Varian a satisfying redemption arc and allowing him to smoothly transition back in with the main cast. Let's take a look and see just how satisfying and smooth this redemption and retransition actually is, shall we? She starts by saying that it's expected that Varian would get redeemed and reunited with his father. And since this is a show for kids, we have no disagreements with that. But then she goes on, And while it's not as impactful as his arc in season one, it's still expertly written. Even though Varian is now working with Keanu Reeves and the Freedom Fighters, he's not really evil anymore. And he has no true aggression towards Rapunzel and her friends, which makes a lot of sense. First of all, this is again minimalizing Varian's actions. His new friends have literally made Rapunzel's parents forget everything. And the whole kingdom, all her friends, are enslaved, living in fear, soon to lose their memories as well. 
I get that he doesn't approve of the Saporians' outright violence, but how is this behavior not really evil or not truly aggressive toward Rapunzel and her friends? Second, forgetting that for a moment, pun intended, how does Callistar's assertion about Varian's attitude make sense? Varian's dad is still stuck in amber because Raps and the kingdom turned their back on him in his time of need. Rapunzel's cooperation in the season one finale was under duress, and thus should be viewed as too little too late. So if the circumstances haven't changed at all, why would it make sense for his attitude about it to change? Callie Star, as usual, makes statements but doesn't back them up with explanations. We think it could be argued that Varian has a bit of dichotomy of desire here, like Cass did. He wants to be friends with Raps and the others again because he realizes that he went way too far. But there's a part of him that still wants them to receive some sort of retribution for what happened. I just want to point out we appreciate how the writers lampshade the problem with Varian's logic in regard to erasing people's memories so they won't forget. It makes for some good, almost self-deprecating humor, but it's still a problem. As already mentioned, we have some fixes in mind that we'll share later. Anyway, Kelly Star continues to try to justify Varian's behavior by playing the sympathy card, which, come to think of it, seems to be the sole basis for all her argumentation. I mean, honestly, what else is he supposed to do? It's kind of hard to join back into society after you try to destroy it. At this point, Varian is just lost and needs someone to lead him back on the right path. What else is he supposed to do? Well, as Rapunzel suggests, and he immediately recognizes is the more reasonable approach, he could just try to show himself trustworthy by doing the right thing over and over and over again. We are so glad Callie Star was not in charge of writing this show. What she's suggesting here, that his bad choices are justified, because what else is he supposed to do when he's already made bad choices? That's such a bad message to send to kids, goodness gracious. And her point about Varian being lost and needing to be led back, we're all for stories of friends helping friends find the right path again. But the way she says it just removes all agency and responsibility from Varian. We wish she'd said, Varian knows he's lost, but a drowning person can't just stop drowning. He needs someone to step in and help. Deep down, he knows that, but it's hard to reach out for help when you feel like you don't deserve it. Whether that phrasing is more accurate can be debated, but just like with his initial turn, Varian's return is on a dime. So he must realize that what he's doing is not only wrong, but also foolish. He knows he needs someone to throw him a lifeline, but he doesn't think he deserves it. But when Rapunzel, one of the people he sorely wronged, suggests to Varian that he just has to give people a chance to forgive him. He has this epiphany. Seriously, watch this moment. There is no way that they will ever forgive me. How do you know if you don't give them the chance? It's like, boom, maybe I've got a chance to set things right after all. Remember what we said earlier of how Callie Star describes this as the writers? Giving Varian a satisfying redemption arc and allowing him to smoothly transition back in with the main cast. After his epiphany, within the space of one minute, he turns against the Separatists and ends up in the cell with Rapunzel, whereupon he expresses remorse and Rapunzel welcomes him back into the fold, with the other characters quickly following her lead. Yeah, there's certainly nothing smoother than another unearned 180 degree turn over the course of a single episode. Callie Star continues by saying that the writers gave Varian a nice, very well needed talk with Rapunzel, like we should have done this two seasons ago needed, then allow him to redeem himself through actions by saving the kingdom instead of just being like, I double, triple, quadruple promise to be a good guy for reals this time. Originally, I agreed with the sentiment that Rapunzel should have talked to Varian sooner, but the more I thought about it, the more it didn't make sense from a writer standpoint, which is the angle Callie Star claims to be speaking from. The whole point of Varian's existence was to force the transition to season two, so Rapunzel couldn't have talked him down.
down before the finale. Perhaps they could have snuck in a small scene after the big showdown where Rapunzel tries to talk to Varian, but he's still too sour to hear her out. And maybe you can see in the background the silhouette of his cellmate, the Saporian Separatist, to hint at the comeback in season three. But ultimately, any sort of immediate tie-up of his story would interrupt the otherwise smooth transition into season two, so I don't really think it fits. And since the king had expressed that he would try to help Varian and Kirin, it's also believably in character that Rapunzel would instead shift her attention to following the rocks. Besides that, the timing for Varian's return is significant. Getting him back as a friend right after Cass has betrayed her is important for Rapunzel to experience, because it gives a foundation for her unrelenting belief that there's hope for Cass too, despite everything that happens in the rest of season three. But we also want to address Callistar's claim that Varian is redeemed through his actions of saving the kingdom. Yes, he helps. A little bit. But it is very clearly Rapunzel who saves the kingdom, while Varian clumsily attempts to aid her. Yet Callie Star makes Varian out to be the hero, which again is a misrepresentation. However, we do appreciate, like she says, that Varian shows his change of heart instead of just saying sorry. Show versus tell is one of the most basic writing principles, so it's another way we get to see that the writers of Tangled the series are generally good at what they're doing. But what happens after that? Callie Star summarizes it by saying, And then Varian just kind of vibes. She takes about 30 seconds to run through the rest of his appearances in the series, not giving it much more time than when she just ignored the rest of Cass's arc. Again, this is not analysis. This is not a detailed examination of the elements or structure of these characters or their arcs. There is nothing that can be learned from vaguely skimming over plot and character developments. Even an episode that does add further to Varian's arc, she just glosses over, saying, And there's episode 10, which is a good Varian arc episode. Absolutely no explanation for how it adds to his arc or what makes it good, just nothing. Episode 10 is Be Very Afraid. Varian has to deal with facing the people that he hurt who aren't as forgiving as Rapunzel. He struggles with his guilt. Even though he's trying to help solve the problems they're facing, he's afraid of making a mess of things again, endangering his father or making the people of Corona hate him even more. It's a good lead up to his role in Cassandra's Revenge, where as someone who has now come full circle, he's able to speak directly to what Cass's future could look like if she keeps going down that path. Path. Unfortunately, like the rest of Varian's key moments, this recovery portion of his arc is rather rushed. After he helps Rapunzel stop another disaster, actually being far more helpful than he was with defeating the Separatists, she spreads the word about that. So by the end of the episode, the rest of Corona has forgiven his prior misdeeds. After the confrontation with Cassandra, Varian focuses on defensive solutions for if or when she attacks Corona, which is great and all until we get to Project Obsidian. Am I the only one who finds it weird that Varian built a gun that shoots Amber? You know, the thing that almost killed his dad and caused him severe, irreversible mental trauma? We're just gonna fire that stuff around like it's nothing. You know what, this is actually pretty in character. As Callie Star correctly points out, this makes no sense given what Varian went through because of the Amber. But then, as per usual, Callie Star just dismisses it because Varian's arc is flawless in her eyes. She says it's pretty in character for him, but doesn't explain how. To be honest, I'm torn. On the one hand, I feel his experiences should have more of a lasting impact on his character, making him hold on to a fear of using it. But on the other hand, the whole point of episode 10 is about facing fears, recognizing that they have no substance. And once you know this, there's nothing to fear. Every neurosis will just Varian had to face his fear of the Amber going out of control and hurting people again, and he conquered his fear. So in that way, it does make sense for him to be freely experimenting with the Amber again. Would I have preferred a little more caution in his handling of it? Yes. Again, the fact that he's so completely over his fear after one episode 
feels a bit rushed, but that's consistent with his handling thus far in the series. And we'll talk about that a bit more in the conclusion. For now, let's finish up our look at Cassandra's arc. Remember how we said that part of the problem with Cass's villain arc is how it's tied up with Xanteri? We think another reason that Cass's villain arc is weak is because it overlaps with her return arc. Even from the very first episode of season three, we see that Cass isn't entirely committed to this betrayal. Cassandra, listen, I know, I know it isn't true. It's just look into my eyes well, now. I know you feel it too. Perhaps I do. Over the course of the season, she waffles back and forth, believing herself to be stuck between a rock and a hard place. She doesn't want to give up and go back to the way things were, but Zontiri insists that the only way to go forward is through Rapunzel, and Cass doesn't want to go that way either. Destroy Rapunzel? But I, I could Cass, somewhere inside you know. This isn't right. Just come back home with us. Yes, it's true. My path is dark. Nothing good comes out of a rift, huh? I know. I... I've been not the nicest person lately, but that's going to change. It does lend a bit to the feeling of repetitiveness that Callie Stark complained about, but I feel like she completely missed why it was that way, since she clearly wasn't analyzing the arc like she claimed or doing any research. Part of the reason, we think, is due to the fact that Disney cut the production short, telling the writers that they had to fit everything for the final season into 21 episodes rather than the planned 35, so they had to kill two birds with one stone. And by having Having this internal back and forth clearly presented throughout her villain arc, we are constantly being shown that Cass is on the verge of returning at any moment. Interestingly enough, the episode Beginnings is almost a callback to Great Expectations. In both episodes, we see Cass overlooking her friends in her eagerness to prove herself, but her friends remind her that she is wanted, just as she is, and in the end, she readjusts her priorities again. There's something else that means a lot more. It comes at a time when both the audience and Rapunzel need that reminder about the kind of person Cass truly is, one who doesn't want to sacrifice her friendships to get a leg up. It gives Rapunzel hope, and it's her explanation for why she refuses to give up on Cass. So throughout season three, we keep seeing these little moments of the goodness in Cass coming back to the surface, even in their big finale fight. <laughs> Made that one, please. All this means that when she at last comes around in the final episode, it's not as abrupt as it would be otherwise, but it does weaken her stint as a villain. While she certainly does bad things, I never get that feeling of truly evil from her as I do from Varian when he pilots the Mecha trying to kill Rapunzel's family and then her. But that could just be me. What does Callie Star have to say about it? And then we reach the end of the season finale, where poor Cass has been so mangled by the writers that they don't even know what to do with her and just send her off into the woods. What a waste of an arc. At this point, are you even surprised? As we have already detailed, Cassandra was not mangled by the writers in any way. They knew exactly what they were doing from beginning to end. It's not flawless, but it's pretty darn good. And it's been clearly established that Cass wants to be her own person and forge her own path. So her choice to travel isn't coming out of nowhere. Not to mention, just like with Varian, there's going to be some serious, deserved tension between her and the people of Corona now. So it's perfectly understandable that after all that, she would make the decision to leave. And to address criticisms that Cass should have gone to prison for her actions, we agree from a realism standpoint. But since those people, in the same breath, often act like it was insane that Varian got imprisoned for his actions, those criticisms don't hold much weight in the end. Ultimately, from a writing standpoint, we think that Cassandra's send-off is a sensible and natural conclusion to her character arc. In a way, everyone found exactly where they were meant to be. As mentioned earlier, we have an idea for how we would have liked to see Varian's arc play out, if we could give it a little extra time and attention. Since it is a corruption arc, we'd like to see some internal or external corrupting influences, something that implants the lie and or triggers the acceptance of the lie. Since Varian starts out as such a cheerful, compassionate guy, we think it makes more sense to have an external corrupting influence. So the writers could have had the separatists of support 
Euphoria manipulate him into helping them already in season one. Perhaps after their attempts to use Cass failed in episode nine. If they gave him the recognition and connection he so badly wanted, it wouldn't be hard to win him over. It could start out small. Varian could provide the Separatists with a few alchemical concoctions. He wouldn't even really know what they plan to use it for. He just knows that someone appreciates him and his gift of alchemy. Then, as the rock problem gets worse, his father goes alone to see the king. He returns and tells Varian that the king granted them more land, but Varian angrily argues that that's not good enough. The new land will just eventually be taken over by the rocks as well. Kieran says they'll make do. Varian loses respect for the king over this apparent apathy toward their situation, and the Separatists get him onto their side even more. They tell him they just want independence from an uncaring king. He agrees that old Corona would be better off as new Saporia. His involvement would take a darker step. He'd become an active member, committing small crimes with the Separatists against Corona. It may not seem like much, but it's desensitizing him for the next step down the path. Kieran eventually finds out, and the two argue. But because Varian has established relationships with the Separatists, who give him the emotional support he craves, he's no longer so attached to what his father thinks of him. He still loves his dad, but it doesn't matter as much if he's proud of him. Then his dad accidentally upsets sets something in the laboratory and causes the spill onto the rocks, which begin encasing him. Varian is desperate to get him out because he doesn't know what damaging effect the Amber may have on Kirin. He remembers Rapunzel has a connection to the rocks and he hurries to her for help, but the guards won't let him through. They say they'll pass on his message, but they run into Nigel before they reach Rapunzel. Nigel turns Varian away, telling him that Rapunzel cannot, will not, take the time to see him. And Nigel never tells Rapunzel that Varian came because he considers it a distraction from the true crisis at hand. Varian's attachment to the kingdom of Corona was already dying, and this puts the nail in the coffin. He doesn't ask for Rapunzel's help again. Instead, he gets some help from the Separatists. But ultimately, he'd sideline his work for their cause to focus on helping his dad. So they distance themselves pretty quickly, hinting at how their interest in him is more about what they can get from him. This also means that the first time Rapunzel really learns about Varian's dad being encased is when she comes to rescue her mother. At first, Varian's villainy would more so be that he just doesn't care what collateral damage may occur in his pursuit of his goal to free his father. But his actions, of course, incite open tension and quickly escalate things toward animosity between him and the kingdom, thus leading to the vicious showdown in the season one finale. Varian is too caught up in the moment to really process that Rapunzel was truly ignorant of his predicament, but it is mentioned so that he knows and can process it later. After ending up in prison, becoming cellmates with the Separatist leader, as is the case already, they'd reappear working together in season three, whereupon we'd lean into the dichotomy of desire, which has Varian still wanting to punish the kingdom, but also wanting his friendship with Rapunzel and the others to be restored. Instead of synthesizing a memory wipe potion, he'd be creating a mind control potion. It would make the Saporian takeover as non-violent as possible, and also enable him to order anyone he wants to be his friend again. The conversation between him and Rapunzel when they are on opposite sides of the cell door would more so be her calling him out on the fact that a manipulated friendship is no friendship at all. It's at this this point that the Saporians come for Varian, and the way they treat him gives him vibes of the fake, manipulated friendship that his relationship with them is. They say the ship is ready for them to deploy the mind control, and Varian suggests that they bring Rapunzel along to watch her kingdom fall. They board the ship, maybe having to fight off Eugene and company in the process, and Rapunzel is tied up where she can see it all happen. But at the last moment, Varian sabotages the drop and frees Rapunzel so she can help him fight against the Saporians, which was his true purpose in having her brought on board. Instead of fumbling his way through the fight, he's actually competent
efficient and helpful, purposely using the bubble concoction to get rid of the rebels. He and Rapunzel ride the airship high above Corona together, and he's with her when they destroy it, protected from the explosion and the fall within Rapunzel's magic hair. Afterward, Rapunzel remarks that his alchemical abilities astound her, and she wants him to hold an official position in the kingdom. He disagrees, pointing out that all his creations so far have been harmful. She encourages him to learn from his mistakes and not let fear hold him back, sowing the seeds for episode 10, and then they go rescue his father. As for Cassandra, even though we disagreed with Hezu Neutral's other points regarding Cass, we did like some of her suggested rewrites. Her proposal that Cass takes the Moonstone in order to protect Rapunzel rather than betray her, but the Moonstone corrupts her was a pretty cool idea. And of course, it can potentially remove Xantiri from the equation, which would strengthen the arc. I don't know. We're just spitballing here. What do you think? Let us know in the comments below what you'd add or change in Varian or Cassandra's arc in order to flesh it out a bit more. Before we conclude this video, we thought it'd be good to quickly mention a couple videos on character arcs that Emmy looked up while writing this script, and that we believe may be useful to others as well. This video by Tyler Mowry explains the different character arc types, positive, flat, and negative, including the three negative arc subtypes, disillusionment, fall, and corruption. He also goes into a fourth main arc type known as open-ended. For each arc type and subtype, he gives clear and detailed examples, breaking down the different thematic points that make them all unique from each other. It's the third video in a series he's called The Fundamentals of Screenwriting. We haven't watched all of them, but found the ones we have watched to be very informative. And Abby Emmons does a video specifically on negative character arcs that we found really insightful. She explains that all three different subtypes of the negative arc can be boiled down to one simple principle. And in a follow-up video, she explains what that principle looks like in application, using a few different film examples. Her channel in general has some really good information in it, so be sure to take a look around. Links to both these videos will be down in the description, so if you're looking for some good resources, resources for writing negative character arcs, you can check them out. Oh, and just because we couldn't find a better place to put this, we wanted to mention this really interesting Tumblr post that Emmy found that breaks down the clothing designs of Raps, Eugene, and Cass throughout TTS, and how each change signifies different aspects of their character development. I'll throw that link in the description as well, in case you're interested. Callie Star begins her introduction to Varian with this attitude. Let's start by figuring out how we're supposed to do this kind of arc and look at the great writing behind Varian. Whereas she introduces Cassandra with this attitude. It's time to talk about the dreaded Cassandra Moonstone arc and why it could have worked if it had been handled much differently. In addition to the clear bias, it's worth noting that she didn't do either of those things. She didn't figure out how one is supposed to do a corruption arc, and she didn't talk about how Cass's arc could have worked if handled much differently. Unless you count her assertion that the writer should have just copied Varian's arc, which we don't. Her video title is basically clickbait. She's not analyzing the writing as she claims she's just gushing over her favorite character. And to support her claims about how amazing he is, she's unfairly dumping on a character she doesn't like. If you want to do something like that, at least be honest and just call it a rant or a review like Hezu Neutral did. If Callie Star had analyzed the writing, she might have actually come to appreciate Cassandra's arc for what it was. The same way I have come to appreciate Varian's arc while writing this script. Like I said, analysis is kind of our thing. So when writing this, I wanted to be sure I was getting things right. I'd never really thought much of Varian's arc before this. But now that I see what the writers were trying to achieve, I respect how they executed it. Varian's still not my favorite character, which, based on what I've seen, puts me in a minority. But I do appreciate his role and journey in the story. Honestly, the hype surrounding Varian vs. Cass reminds me of a conversation we've had on our channel of Anna vs. Elsa. If you like a certain personality type better than another, that's fine. But you shouldn't be treating a personality you don't like as much to be the same as a person who is inherently unlikable. Anyway, we don't know if Callie Star's misrepresentation of the facts is out of ignorance or out 
of intention. But either way, it's clear she did little to no research. Given just how inaccurate some of her claims are, we can't help wondering if she even took the time to at least rewatch the necessary episodes from the series while writing her script. As somewhat of a side note, while I was finishing writing this script, I noticed that Kelly Star put out another Tangled the Series analysis video, trying to rewrite Cass's arc and fix the problems. We watched it and unsurprisingly discovered that it was founded on the same ignorant misconceptions as she expressed in the video we're responding to, so her proposed fix isn't great. Not only does she double down on her claims that Cassandra's story makes no sense and therefore is deserving of no sympathy, but but after claiming that she's going to keep in mind the original creator's objective, she turns the established setting and characters completely upside down in order to make Cass into a social revolutionary. Down with the aristocracy! And even though she acknowledges how far removed her version is from what the original creators were going for, having essentially turned it into the American Revolution, she claims that these are minor flaws compared to how much she has improved Cass. And a asserts that her theme of social equality is actually better than the theme of forgiveness. Personally, I would think that they are equally important and meaningful themes, but given the target audience, forgiveness may be a bit more relatable and applicable to their daily lives, and thus may be more appropriate than the more mature theme of social equality. Not to mention, again she shows how bad she'd be at writing for a young audience, since the way her story plays out, Cass is successful in creating change because because she turned to betrayal and violence. And that finally made Rapunzel stop and take note. Which is the antithesis of the message that the original creators seem to be showing, as we mentioned earlier. Elsewhere in that video, Kali Star does address and adjust a couple of her points that she made in her original video, such as Rapunzel being out of character for not assuming that Cass was going to betray her. But we decided to leave our rebuttal to those points as is in our script since we felt they still warranted a response. However, we did want to acknowledge that she'd already addressed some things. Getting back to her first analysis though, Kali Star concludes her summary of Varian's negative arc saying, the overall conclusion here is that Varian is one of Tangled the series' best written characters. His journey in season one from an optimistic underdog to a tragic villain forced down a bad path is amazing on paper and in execution. There's proper build up for his transformation, and the transformation itself never feels unreasonable or over the top. Varian's redemption and tackling of his trauma in season three is also very well done. Again, setup and execution are what's important here. And for Varian, the show writers do a great job. And she concludes her summary of Cass's arc by saying, like Varian, and Cass gets pushed aside and underestimated by the people around her, and she finally becomes fed up with these wasted opportunities and decides to take it out on who she believes is the cause of it all, Rapunzel. Unfortunately, this arc does not carry enough emotional weight to support an entire season, unlike Varian's villain arc, which had a fairly strong emotional setup. Again, I find it incredible how she is aware that the two are essentially identical, but she calls one sympathetic great writing and the other unsympathetic bad writing. Which just solidifies our point that what this analysis really boils down to is bias. Her video is essentially devoid of any actual analysis. It's just fangirling over Varian. Even when talking about Cassandra, half the time she's just reiterating how great she thinks Varian is, constantly using appeals to emotion to support her position. If she was actually trying to analyze their arcs in comparison to her corruption arc formula, it seems that she weighed the traumatic event part of her equation more important than the setup part, despite her preaching about how the setup and execution are what's important. Hence why Varian's turn gets a pass with almost no setup, and why she claims that Cass's turn didn't work because the traumatic event wasn't traumatic enough. Which again is an insulting mentality toward victims of child abuse. As we said, Kelly Star isn't the only one who thinks Varian's betrayal makes better sense than Cassandra's. Maybe people just relate to his experience more so they can understand his motivations better and find him more likable. That's fine. The problem arises when people completely disrespect Cass's trauma because they don't relate to it and don't bother trying to understand or empathize 
vilifies, instead deeming her unlikable. And that's not right. When you're posting videos and comments saying that childhood emotional abuse isn't tragic enough, or happened too long ago to carry any emotional weight or garner sympathy, deeming it nonsense or being over dramatic when that trauma leaks out, that is deeply hurtful to people who have experienced it and are still dealing with that burden. Personally, I think Kelly Star should take down her video and post a public apology, but I doubt that will happen for two reasons. One, because as she mentioned in her follow-up video, it's gotten her channel some sweet views. So even if she sees this video, I doubt she'll give that up, or even respond at all since, two, we're a much smaller channel than she is. In the past, when we've responded to bigger channels' videos, we've either been ignored or only their fans come and fill our comment section with prejudiced criticism. Our critique is treated as invalid because we're not as popular. But maybe that's just my pessimism talking. Who knows? Anyway, let's sum up our thoughts regarding Varian and Cass. We don't think that Varian is a badly written character from a technical letter of the law standpoint. As already said, the writers had a clear goal in mind for his involvement, and despite being created as a plot device, he was actually handled quite decently. His character has dimension, and while every point of his arc was rushed, each of his changes are clearly set up, executed, and resolved. And many fans consider his character to be sympathetic and entertaining. His greatest weakness as a character is really that the creators kept his role in perspective. Him and his story are not the focus of the series, so he's not given more time. Suspension of disbelief is pushed to the limit in order to accept his turnarounds, since they happen so quickly and so completely. And that's why we think, from a more spirit of the law kind of approach, that his character and arc aren't handled very well. Certainly not a gold standard to copy in your own writing. Meanwhile, Cass's character and arc are given much more depth and attention as we've shown. She's just overall, objectively, much better written. However, as we mentioned, there are clear weaknesses in her writing. And the reality is that it seems most fans just didn't really get her character. So that is a factor to consider as well in terms of writing success. Our conclusion is that there is definitely something to be learned from analyzing and comparing Varian and Cassandra's arcs. But Callie Star, on top of all the other problems with her video, failed to provide any meaningful insight into either of these characters' stories. If you want to learn from something, you have to be honest about both its strengths and its shortcomings. Ironically, Callie Star said in her follow-up, The key here is honesty. Being negative for the sake of being negative, or to get those sweet views, makes for hyperbolic criticism that doesn't help anyone. And yeah, dishonest, self-serving, hyperbolic criticism that doesn't help anyone pretty much sums up her video. Anyway, we both really enjoyed the Tangled series and would recommend watching it or re-watching it if you want. We've actually talked about it before, having made a couple videos on Eugene in both the series and the movie. If you want to see more of our content on this topic, feel free to check those out. And if you're interested in seeing some bonus content, such as bloopers, outtakes, and other fun tidbits we came up with while making this video, you can find it over on Patreon. In the meantime, if you appreciated this character arc analysis, please leave us a thumbs up and let us know in the comments. Also, share it around and subscribe for more content like this. And please consider becoming a patron to support the future of this channel. Stay loud and proud, folks, and we'll see you next time.